All right. So good evening, everybody. We are on live, Facebook Live. I want to take a moment uh, to welcome you guys to this great broadcast. Uh, this is Truth Moment. On live, Facebook Live. I want to take a moment. I think we're getting feedback. So if you guys are watching Facebook Live, uh, Brother Jermaine, Pastor Damon, if you guys can mute it on your other lines, that would help. Um, I'm not watching it. Gotcha. Okay. So I want to thank you guys for being on. We're excited to have everybody here uh, viewing in with us on Facebook. Um, I want to thank you guys for being on. So as you know, this is Truth Moment, and we have the opportunity to talk about so many different subjects, so many different things, and um, we always come from a Christian perspective. But even within that Christian perspective, sometimes there are challenges, differences. Sometimes people that say they believe the Bible don't even believe the Bible. And sometimes we have different nuances within scripture um, that we look at completely differently. Sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes it's, it's you know, different opinions and different backgrounds and theological views and different things like that vary. But at the end of the day, the point is we have the opportunity uh, to come together together. Uh, to break bread and reason together, as the scriptures say. And so tonight, I'm really excited that I have uh, two esteemed guests on here, uh, two of my brothers in Christ who, um, you know, stand in difference of, of opinion as it relates to scripture. And so tonight, we have the opportunity to talk about this and, uh, you know, kind of share some things. So this is actually an official debate. And the first person I want to introduce to you guys tonight as we prepare to get into it, um, is Brother Jermaine Wright. He is the overseer at, uh, at the Holy Fellowship of the Ecclesia and Re at Richmond, Virginia. Let me just share a little bit about my brother really quickly. Uh, he has served in this capacity for 10 years. The Ecclesia is a Christian organization that prides themselves on excellent biblical teaching, study, and practice being faithful only to the evidence of the Holy Scripture rather than the traditions of men, cultural norms, and popular uh, religious worldviews. So tonight, I want to introduce you guys uh, to Brother uh, Jermaine Wright. Brother Jermaine, go ahead and say something to the people, man. Hello, everyone. Glad you can join us tonight. Looking forward to a good debate. Thank you, Thank Jake. You. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, the other brother... I want to introduce you guys to as well. Uh, he is uh, a guy that many of you have seen quite often in these discussions. Uh, but just in case this is your first time, uh, let me introduce you to our brother, uh, Pastor Damon Richardson, a little bit formally. Uh, so I'm going to read his bio as well so you guys understand the guys that you're going to be hearing from uh, tonight. Uh, he is the founder of Urban Logia Ministries, an urban theological and apologetics resource. He's a Bible teacher and Christian urban apologist. He was born in Queens, New York. Don't hold that against him, y'all. He wasn't <laughs> from Boston. <laughs> but he grew up in Clearwater, Florida, and now lives uh, with his wife and children in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, he lived his formative years as a Muslim and practiced the tenets of Islam through the teachings of Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. Until he, he, until he became a born again believer in Jesus Christ at the age of 16 and responded to the call to preach a year later. His preaching and teaching ministry spans 28 years and he has pastored churches in Brooklyn, uh, Brooklyn, New York, Michigan and Florida. He holds a master of arts and religious studies from Beulah Heights University where he's current, currently a PhD uh, candidate. So I wanna Introduce to some and I'll present to others our friend, uh, Pastor Damon Richardson. Go ahead and say something to the people, man. All right. God bless you. And uh, certainly glad to be on again uh, with uh, my uh, dear host, uh, Brother Jason, and our the gentleman from Virginia. Uh, uh, we thank God for this debate. And what we're going to be discussing tonight is of critical importance to the gospel, and I pray that every person that is listening is edified. Praise God. Praise God. So listen, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to uh, lay out the rules. Now, me and the brothers have already talked. We've already come to understanding on the terms, 
and the agreement of this debate. Uh, but just for you that are watching or watching the replay, God bless you guys. We want to give you an opportunity to understand how it works so that you understand the flow of everything. Um, so what we're going to do tonight, we're going to do this this way. Uh, uh, Brother Jermaine, he'll be holding the affirmative. Uh, he'll be holding the affirmative, which means that his position is that uh, we are required to follow um, the Sabbath or keep the Sabbath. I'm sorry. And uh, Pastor Damon, on the other hand, is from the negative position where he disagrees with that. And so um, they're going to speak from those. And here's how it will flow. And our first segment, the first part will be the negative proposition. Pastor Damon will have 12 minutes and I'll be timing it. So don't worry, y'all. I got the power in my hand to press that mute button. If things go crazy. Uh, but he has 12 minutes to introduce uh, the negative proposition. And then uh, Brother Jermaine will have 12 minutes uh, to do his affirmative proposition. From there, Pastor Damon will give his first <clears throat> rebuttal and then at, for seven minutes. And then Brother Jermaine will have seven minutes to do his affirmative rebuttal. After that, Pastor Damon will have an opportunity for seven minutes to do an additional rebuttal. And then Brother Jermaine will have a chance as well uh, to do his second rebuttal for seven minutes. All right. So this will keep us about right under an hour. All right. Right under an hour. The second part of this will be Q&A. So this is what I'm going to need for you guys in the audience to do. Those viewers that are watching, you got your laptops, your notepads, all that stuff. I want you to listen closely to what they're saying tonight. Uh, for all the trolls, if you troll too much and get in the way, I'm blocking you. All right. We want to make sure that people have an opportunity to hear what's being said and they're not too distracted by one person who's trying to create a platform for themselves on this broadcast. So we're cool with comments. You can drop some lines, but we don't want you having your own theological debate while we're trying to have this conversation. OK, so I'm going to ask that you'll respectfully participate. But at the end, we're going to open it up for some questions. So maybe there's some questions that you have in regards to this topic based on what was said um, and we'll choose from those and these brothers will have a chance to respond as well. All right. So with that being said, I'm going to start with a word of prayer and then we're going to get into it. Okay. And so father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you. And we praise you for another day, for another opportunity and another time of fellowship and discussion. God, we don't just pray for these two uh, brothers that are debating, but we pray also for the viewers, for the people that are listening and watching. We pray that the Holy Spirit would take precedence over everything and that the word of God would be established in our heads and in our hearts, that true understanding would come from what is shared tonight. And ultimately, Lord, you'll be glorified through what happened. So we thank you and we praise you for the truth. We pray that it will, it will be revealed through this conversation and in the heart of your people and even those that are far from you. We pray that things that are said tonight will draw them closer to giving their lives to you and accepting Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior. Yes, Lord. Thank you, and we praise you. you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, y'all. So with no further ado, uh, we're going to start, uh, and the floor is yours for 12 minutes, Pastor Damon. All right. Amen. Hang on just a second. Just uh, having some technical difficulties. Okay, good deal. All right, so I am establishing the, uh, the negative uh, constructive. Uh, that means that my position uh, is that the Sabbath is not a requirement for Christians to keep under the new covenant. And so for the next uh, 12 minutes, I am going to be building my, uh, my case and um, I'm going to start with uh, Genesis 2 and 3. Uh, the word of the Lord says, God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his works of creation. And so one of the things that we, that is often argued uh, from this text is, is that God was establishing uh, the ordinance or the observance of the Sabbath. Uh, but what we see here from this text is, is that God is ceasing uh, the word Shabbat. He is ceasing from his labor. And later he utilizes this pattern or his ceasing from labor 
as a pattern for the Sabbath. Uh, but what cannot be established from this text, uh, nor any other prior to Exodus 16, Exodus 20, and Deuteronomy 5, uh, is that any of the patriarchs ever kept or was commanded to keep the Sabbath. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, particularly verses 1 through 16, uh, but we'll look at verse 5. Moses summoned all of Israel and said unto them, uh, he says, this he says, the Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. He did not make this covenant with our fathers, but with all of us who are alive here today. And, and so uh, one of the reasons that we've got to understand that the Sabbath was designed for Israel and Israel only is that this text says in very plain language that God did not make this particular covenant uh, with any of our fathers, and, and that word fathers there uh, is used in the Hebrew for the patriarchs. Uh, Moses said, God did not make this covenant with the fathers. He made it with us, that is their descendants, all of us who are alive today and our offspring. Uh, and so he's, uh, hang on just a second. Uh -oh. Okay. Uh, my, uh, so he made it with their offspring, all of them that were there on that day, not previous to that. And then, of course, the, the word of the Lord says, be careful to remember the Sabbath day to keep it as holy, to keep it holy uh, as the Lord your God commanded. You are to labor six days, do all of your work. And verse 15, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. The Lord your God brought you out of there with a strong hand. And so we have three things from this text. Number one, uh, the Sabbath, which is a sign of the covenant that God made with them, was only made with them and their future generations, their offspring. It was not made with the patriarchs before them. Number two, specifically, it's the Israelites. And when we say Israelites, we are talking about the natural offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Further evidence of that is, is, is that the purpose for the Sabbath was inextricably connected to their, uh, their slavery in Egypt. And so God says to them, because I delivered you from Egypt, you are to keep the Sabbath. And so for those who say that we are to keep the Sabbath, several things that they've got to point to. Number one, uh, are they the physical offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? That's number one. Number two, were they, or that is, their ancestors delivered from uh, bondage in Egypt? And so we can see here that the command to keep the Sabbath is specifically for national Israel. And so uh, the next verse I want to look at is Exodus chapter 31, <clears throat> verses 12 through 14. It says, the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you must observe my Sabbath, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, so that you will know that I am the Lord who consecrates you. Observe the Sabbath, for it is holy to you. So you'll notice that the Sabbath uh, is specifically, again, given to the Israelites. Yahweh says it is a sign between me and you. He does not say that it is a sign between me and all of the nations. Now, this is very important. And so you'll notice what Yahweh says. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. So you will know that I am the Lord who consecrates you. Observe the Sabbath for it is holy to you. So you'll notice that God is telling, requiring the Israelites to keep the Sabbath holy that is sanctified among them, even as God has sanctified Israel or set them apart from the nations. When we make the Sabbath a sign for all of the nations, what we are actually doing is undermining the special relationship that God had with Israel. In other words, he called them out so that they might be a holy nation, a sanctified people. He did not call all the nations out, but he called Israel out from the nations. And in that same way, he is saying, you are to sanctify one day out of the week, which is the seventh day, even as I have sanctified you. 
when we attempt to make the Sabbath an observance for all nations and for all people, particularly even Gentiles under the new covenant, we are failing to understand that it was a sign between Yahweh and Israel specifically connected to him calling their nation out from the other nations of the ancient Near East. And so another point that I want to make is in Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. You are to labor six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath uh, to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male or female servant, um, your livestock, or the resident alien who is it within your city gates. And so you'll notice verse 11. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything in them in six days. He rested on the seventh day. So you'll notice that the resident alien is included in this. But the resident alien uh, is uh, the equivalent of a proselyte. So, so the only reason that they are being given this particular command is because they are coming to live among the Israelites as Israelites. In other words, they are coming into the covenant community. And as a result of coming into the covenant community, they are expected to live as covenant people. But you'll notice that it is only as they come into the gates that the expectation of the Sabbath is upon them. It is not upon them when they are outside of the gates. As long as they are living outside of the commonwealth of Israel, there is no expectation in scripture anywhere where the Israelites uh, or where the nations, the Goyim, were expected to keep the Sabbath. And so again here, you'll notice that he connects it to the creation. And so the... Uh, the exodus is the why of the Sabbath. It is because I have delivered you. But the creation is the how of the Sabbath. This is God explaining to them how they are to do it. And in the very same way that he ceased from his work, they are to do it. He is not establishing in creation the observance of the Sabbath. It is not until they are at Sinai Horeb that he uses what he did at creation as a pattern for what they are to do. And remember Deuteronomy 5, our fathers before us did not receive this covenant. I've got a couple of minutes and I've got to wrap it up. But Matthew 11, verse 27 through 30, uh, Jesus says, no one knows the son except the father. No one knows the father except the son and anyone to whom the son desires to reveal him. In verse 28, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You will notice here that Jesus says, I will give you rest. He does not say that a day will give you rest. He says, I will give you rest. If you come to me, if you lay down your burdens and all of your labor, your work, I will give you rest. And so Jesus confirms here that he is the archetypal Sabbath. He, in other words, he is the rest. The ultimate rest is not in a day, but the ultimate rest is in a person. In Colossians 2, verses 16 to 17, uh, the, the, the word of the Lord here says, uh, let me read it. It says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you uh, in questions of food and drink or with regard to festivals and or of a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Now, my opponent is going to attempt to argue that this word Sabbath is plural, but the fact is throughout scripture, even when you, uh, even if you go back into the Old Testament, which is written in Hebrew, the translation of that, the LXX or the Septuagint, um, translates Sabbath or uh, Shabbat from the Hebrew, Sabbaton, uh, is found oftentimes in the plural, but it only refers to one day. It is not a reference unless the context is about ceremonial Sabbaths, unless the context specifically points to it. But the pluralization of Sabbaton here, it has no bearing on the meaning. It, there is no distinction between ceremonial Sabbaths, all of your, your weekly Sabbath, your monthly Sabbath, 
and your annual Sabbath are all the same. The yeah, one minute left, Damon. I'm sorry. One minute. Exactly. No difference. My last point is this in Colossians, uh, in Colossians uh, 2 verses 16 to 17, you'll notice how Paul says that they were not to give any uh, pass any judgment with regards to what they ate or drank or to the Sabbath. But notice what he says there. He says that these are a shadow of things to come. And so uh, the word there, shadow, is the word skia. It means the thing that's representing the other thing. It is not the thing itself. But what is the thing? According to the verse, Paul says, but the substance that is the soma, the body, the actual form is Christ. So in reality, the Sabbath in true bodily form is Christ. The weekly, the monthly, and the annual Sabbath, according to Paul, is just the skia. It is the shadow. It is what it is pointing to the soma or the body. Thank you. That's your time, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, now we're going to go to Brother Jermaine uh, yes. for your uh, initial uh comments, uh, proposition. So 12 minutes on you, my brother. All right. Thank you. And uh, thank you to uh, Brother Damon Richardson for that uh, eloquent speech and uh, giving his uh, negative uh, position. Uh, we are going to uh, start where Damon started also in Genesis 2 and 3. That is the beginning point. So it's uh, of no mystery that he went there. Uh, Brother Damon, um, uh, brought that point out first, and we're going to go there. It's the beginning. So in the beginning, Genesis 2 and 3, after God uh, creates the world and begins to set things in order, he creates man, and on the sixth day, man is created. The very next day, we see something happen where God ceases from his work, as Damon said, and God uh, does something special here. He pronounces the day to be blessed, hallowed, and sanctified, which means set apart. Uh, not just a, uh, a resting day, but a holy day, hallowed. You guys may remember the term hallowed be thy name from the scripture, from the, uh, uh, the model prayer with Christ. Hallowed means special. Even God's name is hallowed. So this is a very godly and special situation and uh, not just a simple rest from working, uh, though it does include that. So we see that point and uh, we have to begin to put scripture together. Now, we believe in the unity of scripture. Uh, when you see Genesis 2 and 3, uh, man created on the sixth day, then you have the seventh day, uh, the Sabbath created, then you, you can go fast forward ahead to the New Testament and Mark the second chapter. You guys may be f familiar with Mark the second chapter, where Jesus says, uh, uh, Mark 2 and around verse 27, he said the Sabbath was made for what? For man. The Sabbath was made for man. So contrary to arguments that may be presented that the Sabbath was simply made for uh, Israel, we see in creation it was made before there was any Israel. We see that uh, it was only Adam and Eve there. The Sabbath was pronounced blessed. And one thing I want you guys to understand when you read scripture, because we, did, we just don't come by excel excellency of speech, as uh, 1 uh, Corinthians 2nd chapter says, but we have to demonstrate the power of the truth. And when you're dealing with, when you're dealing with scripture, you have to look into who you're dealing with. You're dealing with God. If God bless and sanctifies something, and that something is something to be considered, is it not for believers? So this is what we're dealing with here with the Sabbath. Uh, we go on to another point about patriarchs keeping Sabbath and having uh, understanding of the laws and commandments. Now, the one point I want to bring out from scripture and, and, and giving understanding of how scripture is written uh, is in um, the, book of, the book of Proverbs, 25th verse in the second chapter, it goes on to tell us, that, that it is God's uh, glory to hide a matter, and it is the, uh, the honor of kings to seek it out. So the Bible is not explicit about every situation. However, when you have the spirit of God and you begin to read and put the unity of scripture together, it becomes obvious that the word of God is not separated, but totally connected. And I say that in response to uh, a point that, I, that Damon made and also a point that I was making in my affirmative anyway, the, the commandments of God have been there since the beginning, since the time with uh, Adam and Eve and on to examples such as with Noah. We see that Noah was separating in Genesis uh, the seventh chapter. He was separating clean and unclean uh, animals. 
This happened before the time of uh, Israel. So obviously that law was in place and God taught it to man. God taught man the Sabbath. We see over in uh, Genesis 20, uh, 26 and 5, we see that uh, Abraham is uh, called uh, a friend of God because he kept his commandment, his statutes, and his laws. Now, this is not explicitly shown where he gave it to him. But again, God's glory is to uh, conceal a matter and for man to search it out. And when you begin to put the scriptures together, you can understand how these things work. Another example for, uh, uh, about commandments being in place, obviously, before the um, uh, institution to Israel is uh, Genesis 39. What does Joseph say in Genesis 39 when he's with Politifa's wife? He said it would be sin against God to sleep with this man's wife. And what is that? That's one of the Ten Commandments. So here we have an example of four different situations where the commandments of God are there with the patriarchs. When you go to the book of uh, uh, the book of Hebrews and the 10th chapter, the, uh, the book about faith, it goes on to talk about all the faith of the, uh, the, the, the uh, patriarchs, all the way back to uh, Noah and um, Enoch. And it shows that these men were living by faith, which comes by the hearing of the word of God. Doesn't show exactly uh, how they obtained the understanding, right? We don't have stories about Enoch. Uh, there's speculation about a book of Enoch, which I uh, don't agree with, but we don't have any examples of this. But the word shows us that all the men of God are under the same unction, which is faith. And faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. And God, according to uh, the book of James, uh, the fourth chapter, is lawgiver. He's a he's, he's lawgiver. He gives law. Uh, to uh, to people, and this is what he, we've always had from the beginning. So to assert that the Sabbath and the laws of God were not in place uh, in the beginning uh, is not a it's not a, it's not an accurate assertion. Uh, it can be said, but we have to look at the spirit of the Scripture. Going forward, now more things about the Sabbath and the law. Now we see that Israel was given the uh, commandments in uh, in uh, Sinai uh, in Exodus twenty, and there in Exodus twenty. Uh, we we understand that uh, they were delivered out of Egypt, and as uh, as many of you know, uh, there is uh, shadows and types when it comes down to uh, how the Bible uh, presents. The Bible is a book of prophecy, so uh, we see a, a beginning point of restoring something from the beginning uh, in Genesis two and three, restoring Sabbath to uh, to mankind. Uh, through uh, Moses re, uh, reintroducing, because remember, they went to Egypt, lost the way of God, lost their direction. So God had to reestablish the foundation of his truth, of his law, of his commandments that he gave to Abraham, of his commandments that he gave to Noah and all the patriarchs before then. Even though it is not explicit, when we understand the spirit of scripture, we understand the unity of the faith, one faith, we have to begin to consider, to consider that these things were in place beforehand. Now, uh, a couple of points that I um, also want to address is uh, the fact that uh, the most important point that Christians should understand is that Jesus kept the Sabbath. Now, that there should end the whole conversation. It should end the whole conversation. What are we? What are we supposed to be? What do we claim to be? Christians, followers of Christ. If Christ kept the Sabbath, as we see in Luke 4 and 16, he, kept, he went up and kept the Sabbath as it was his custom, his practice. Christ kept the Sabbath. All of the scriptures that you see referring to Christ and doing works and being questioned, when is it happening on? I'll let you think about an answer. When, when, when is all this occurring? It's occurring on the Sabbath. Christ kept the Sabbath. He taught on the Sabbath. He explained and reasoned to the people on the Sabbath. This is something that is... Uh, undebatable in scripture and never do you hear him uh, teaching or professing or practicing any other day as holy and set apart why because as mark 2 says he is the lord of the sabbath you know uh, i watched brother damon on a debate a few weeks ago where he established a point that christ was the creator of the world he is the logos he is the creator he is the one who spoke everything into existence did christ not create the sabbath did he not create the Sabbath? And when Christ created the Sabbath, was there error and flaw in his creation? Was he confused as to what law to establish regarding a holy day? Or do we decide for God what holy is? But I can find no way in scripture that is reconcilable that we have another day sanctioned uh, as a holy day. Now, most of our Protestant uh, brothers and sisters and Catholics, I grew up Protestant as well. We grew up keeping the tradition of Sunday, of course. But to be uh, absolutely honest to the scripture and genuine 
to uh, the text, there is nothing in scripture that validates any other day, especially not Sunday, as a holy day. There was a meeting on a uh, uh, gathering where Paul spoke and he broke bread. Wasn't was it a holy day? There was, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a couple of mentions of, of the holy days um, of the uh, of Sunday, rather, excuse me, where um, they came to the tomb uh, to see Jesus. Was didn't say it was a holy day. You know, there's nothing in Scripture that validates anything as a holy day but the Sabbath. Now when we go on to prove more about this particular point, I want to point your attention to the Acts, the book of Acts, the New Testament church. Because first of all, not only do we, not only are we uh, bound to keep the Sabbath, but we're bound to keep the holy days. How can I prove that? Well, you so-called Christians say that Acts 2 is the birth of the church. And what day did that occur on? Pentecost. Pentecost is listed in Leviticus 23, along with the Sabbath, as the, uh, as the Sabbath being weekly and Pentecost being annual holy convocations. So Pentecost, uh, Acts 2, they gathered there. Why are they gathered there? Because they're Jewish? No, it's the New Testament. They're keeping Sunday now, right? They all understood that. No, they gathered there because it is a holy day. And not only was it holy, but the manifestation of God's power and prophecy was fulfilled on that day. Now, imagine if you were not keeping Pentecost and you uh, were doing something else because you didn't believe in the holy days. And you would have missed the boat on that particular day because that was a design and purpose plan. All right. And also uh, to, to backtrack a bit. Also, Jesus died on what day? A day called the Passover. Most Christians don't even know. I look on uh, social media during uh, the um, uh, Passover season. I don't see one post about the ninth hour on the on the first of uh, the first month, 14th, according to the Hebrew calendar, easily accessible. No post because Christians don't even know when their Savior died, when the blood that gives them strength was even shed for them. And when was it shed? And when and when did this happen with Acts 2? all on holy appointed days, Sabbath. So not only is the Sabbath binding, brothers and sisters, scripture shows us clearly that the holy days are binding. And let's get back to the Sabbath uh, specifically. How much time I have left? I can't hear you. I can't hear you, brother. You got one minute and 10 seconds. Okay, one minute, 10 seconds. All right. Now, now we have a situation also, we can look in the book of Acts, a few, a few different uh, passages, Acts 13, verses 42. And I hope you guys are not just listening to this. You have to take notes because you need to go back and study this. Acts uh, 13 and 42, you can see very clearly that they were gathering for the Sabbath and the whole uh, congregation of people were there. And the, the Jews actually got mad. The Gentiles were there. What are they doing here? And Paul told them that God is turning also to the Gentiles. And the, the Bible says they came back and begged, could they be preached to the next Sabbath? And the, on the next Sabbath, the whole city came out. Was this not the church of the New Testament? When you go over to Acts 17, you'll see the same thing. You guys go over to those scriptures as well. You see that in Acts 18, all uh, uh, specific situations where you see the Sabbath being kept by the New Testament church, by the New Testament church. And if you examine Acts 17, Acts 16, 17 and 18, you'll see very clearly that this is so. But where do you see Sunday? Where is that mentioned? Where is there a commandment or profession of that Sunday being a holy day in the Bible? So if you don't honor the Sabbath, how could you honor uh, uh, Sunday? It's not even in the Bible, okay? That's your, that's your time, my brother. Thank you. All right. Okay. So uh, we're getting ready to go uh, into our uh, first rebuttal uh, from Pastor Damon, and he will have uh, seven minutes to respond I, I can't wait for both of you guys to get the uh, comments from uh, the viewers, man. They're going crazy on here, guys. So uh, keep talking, keep teaching, and, and let's continue. Uh, Pastor Damon, you have seven minutes, my friend. Okay, so uh, seven minutes is not a long time, so let me get to it. Uh, my job is to provide a rebuttal for Jermaine's uh, position. And so... Uh, Jermaine brought up several verses, and, and you'll notice what he didn't do. Number one, he never established anywhere that anybody prior to Horeb Sinai kept the Sabbath. He kept talking about uh, how we've got to take the spirit of the scriptures. That, that's his clever way of wanting to impose upon the scripture what he wants it to say, but what it doesn't say. And what it doesn't say 
is, is that anybody prior to Sinai Horeb kept the Sabbath. You don't have one scripture, let alone two or three, to establish that. And so you don't find in creation, you don't actually find there uh, an establishing of the Sabbath. However, if we were to look at Genesis 2, for instance, uh, you, you've got a number of things there in Genesis 2. You've got uh, the marriage institution. Uh, you've got, uh, di you've got uh, them, of course, having, eating, having only a vegan diet, uh, and you even have them running around uh, naked. This is before they were clothed. All of those are consistent things that we see prior to the fall. And, and so the, the issue here is, is, is that what you don't see is, is that any of those things are commanded for anybody. Nobody is commanded to be married. Nobody is commanded to eat only a vegan diet. Nobody is commanded to run around naked. Yet we see that those were three features of Genesis chapter two. Uh, what you don't see in Genesis chapter two one, two, or chapter three is Adam receiving a commandment from God to keep the Sabbath. In fact, only one commandment was given there. Uh, so, so that's one thing. He also mentioned that Noah received commands, uh, 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 and, and, and he made that an ambiguous point. But the reality is, is Genesis chapter six says God was the one who told him to build the ark, gave him the dimensions, told him which animals to get. So, so we don't have to spiritualize that. God was the one that actually gave him those specific instructions. It, it's, it's also interesting because he used uh, Mark 2 and 27, uh, where Jesus says uh, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And then he used that to bridge the point uh, that clearly here, that must mean that it, the Sabbath is not just for Israel, but that is not what the text is telling us. First of all, contextually, Jesus is talking to Jewish people. Uh, number two, the word man or anthropos uh, does not uh, uh, distinguish what kind of man, but obviously Israelites are human beings. And so yes, the Sabbath was made for man, but it was specifically made for Israel. Those were the human beings that God made the Sabbath for. And since Israel are not different kind of human beings, we wouldn't expect Jesus to be talking about uh, uh, every kind of man uh, in terms of ethnic distinction, so forth and so on. And so, so the word man there does not undermine the fact that the scriptures clearly reveal Exodus 31, Exodus 20, Deuteronomy 5, that the Bible says in no uncertain terms that the Sabbath was given to Israel as a sign. And then he makes the point that, oh, even Jesus kept the Sabbath. Well, that would be exactly right. Jesus was a Jew. He was supposed to keep the Sabbath. And so he kept the Sabbath as a Jew. But Jesus did, Jesus did a number of things. He kept uh, Kushrat, dietary law. Should we keep Kushrat because Jesus kept Kushrat? Absolutely not. And so Jesus did not come so that he might establish Judaism as the way of life. The Bible clearly tells us that he came to establish a new and living way. He goes to Acts 13 and he reads a scripture where they were gathered in the synagogue on the Sabbath. But here's the interesting thing. There's no commandment in the Old Testament where observing the Sabbath was to be done in worship in the synagogue. In fact, the synagogue was developed sometime during after the Babylonian exile. And so the reality is, is, is that worshiping in a synagogue on the Sabbath is not the observance of the Sabbath. It was the time that they went to worship. But as we read throughout scripture, the early church worshiped every day of the week. They continued in the apostles' doctrine daily. And, and, and so why is it in Acts 13 do you see Paul uh, preaching there in the Sabbath? Because he is attempting to win other Jews to the faith in the Messiah. And that much is clearly revealed. And so the very next text tells us in Acts chapter 13 that on the next Sabbath, 
the Gentiles came out to hear. Were they coming out to observe the Sabbath? No, they were coming out to hear more preaching. So this is not a text that is establishing that the Gentiles were keeping the Sabbath. See, this is what you call proof texting. It is when you're stringing together a number of scriptures without context in order to fit something, a point that, that, that is not actually supported by those verses. And so what you don't have in the New Testament is any command for a Gentile believer in Christ to keep the Sabbath. What you do see is that Gentiles who continued to follow Christ, they continued obviously to keep their culture. There was uh, following Christ, there was no prohibition to following Christ that required them to give up their culture. And so 30 Jews seconds, 30 seconds left. You to be Jews even after they followed Jesus, which meant that they kept all of the feasts, uh, 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 Shavuot or Pentecost. And he also brings that point up. The church was born on Pentecost. Well, that's interesting, but you don't find any command in the New Testament where Gentile believers in Christ are required to keep Pentecost. So uh, our opponent, the gentleman here from Virginia, actually creates more problems for himself. Just because the church is born on Shavuot or Pentecost doesn't mean that Pentecost was an expectation to be kept by any Gentile believers in Christ. In fact- That's your time, sir. Okay. That's your time. That's your time. Thank you. All right. We're going to go for first rebuttal. Brother Jermaine, go ahead, man. You are on the clock for- seven minutes all right thank you thank you well um <clears throat> touching on the point brother damon uh just said that i didn't prove the the uh the point about uh the sabbath being commanded or uh, or being uh, blessed i clearly said the sabbath was blessed and sanctified and hallowed what does that mean that that's not commanded it's, it's something that we shouldn't also do you guys see it continues in scripture even on with israel and even on uh through the new testament that this was a day that was set apart and uh, Jesus said it was made for man. Now, Damon is a, is a master of, of speaking and his words, you know, alluring words, excellency of speech sounds like he's saying something, but really he's denying the scripture because the thing is he, he just made a point that the, the man that was mentioned in Mark 2 wasn't, it wasn't referring to mankind. It, was, it could have been referring simply to Israel. And that to me is a, is a moot point because uh, when the Bible is speaking of Israel, it talks directly about Israel and to the Jews. This is obviously a direction toward man because it goes back to creation, the creation of mankind. So do not be deceived by that type of uh, uh, point and, and uh, deception with that. Now, I want to also go into something. He says that uh, Israel was given these things and they were not for Gentiles. Well, Let's see exactly what the scripture says regarding the, the, the uh, purpose of Israel. You guys remember that Abraham, to his, from his seed, all the nations of the earth should be, would be blessed. Well, who are the nations of the earth? Gentiles. And the thing, the point for the Gentiles were to be able to, uh, uh, to receive the word from the Jews where God established it first with the Jews and the Hebrews in Israel. Now, look here in the Romans, the third chapter, it says, what advantage is there to be a Jew? What profit is there of the circumcision? It says much in every way, chiefly, because then were committed the oracles of God. Gentiles begin to keep the oracles of God that they were never introduced to. He says that the Sabbath was not ever given to the Gentiles. Well, the oracles of God were never given to the Gentiles. God never gave the word of God to anybody but Israel. It was an appointed time when Christ came and he made it very clear to the, to the apostles to go out and preach to all nations. And when they when he gave, when, I, when they went out and preached to them, guess what? They told them about keeping the commandments because they never had these laws. Remember, he said to Israel, Israel in a place, what other nation have I given these laws to? These laws of justice and fairness. So the, the rest of the world were not uh, exposed to the word. They didn't have scripture. And this is the common misconception amongst Protestants and people that don't think the reality is nobody had this Bible but Israel at one point in time. So it's not that it wasn't given to them. It wasn't given to them yet. That's what the Great Commission is all about, to spread the gospel. And I tell you one thing, the Jews weren't certainly spreading, keeping Sunday uh, when, they, when they came and spread that gospel. They were giving them the commandments of God. Now, if you want to separate the Sabbath and say it wasn't a commandment, it was clearly a commandment in Exodus, the 20th chapter. And it was a commandment to Israel. But look at those commandments. Look at those Ten Commandments. Now, do you guys believe in the Ten Commandments? Do you believe in uh, committing adultery or robbing or lying or having idols or any, you guys agree with any of those things? I didn't think so. 
and Sabbath is right there in the midst of those. Those commandments are not just for Israel. Those are moral commandments and standards for all mankind. The first four are directly toward love and adoration toward God, and the rest in the, in the last half are for uh, uh, a direction toward man, for your, uh, your neighbor, your fellow man. That's, that's how the Ten Commandments are broken up. And Damon knows this. He's an educated man. He knows and can read that very clearly. And Jesus gives the summary, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind and soul. And second one is love your neighbor as yourself. That's what the Ten Commandments are. Are those not for everyone? Now, in the matter of love, God uh, prescribes how he is to be loved by not making graven images. And one of those things are honoring him because he says in the Sabbath command, he says, six days I created the earth and the seven I rested. Therefore is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. That's honoring the God of creation. And as a matter of fact, when you deny the Sabbath, you deny your very own God who created the world and everything therein and, you, and, and yourself. So this is where uh, Damon is using a, a sleight of hand regarding the commandments and saying they're not applicable. These 10 commandments are applicable today to everyone. And uh, it's something that we must keep. Uh, so we, how much time I got left, uh, Jay, Jay? Two minutes, 30 seconds. Two minutes, thank you. Now, uh, regarding uh, a couple of points real quick, I want to go over. And um, uh, Damon spoke about Colossians, brought up Colossians 2. Uh, and um, what was that? I can't hear him. He brought up Colossians 2. And he said in Colossians 2 that uh, the Bible spoke about not giving, not giving, uh, I'm sorry, I'm being interrupted. What's, what's going on? The rules are the first rebuttal is to the uh, negative constructive, not to my rebuttal. The second rebuttal is to my rebuttal. My rebuttal was to his affirmative constructive. And so he is not following the rules of the debate. He is attempting to rebuttal my rebuttal instead of my initial uh, my initial uh, negative constructive. Okay. Oh, so we're being petty. Okay. All no, right. That's not. Those are the rules. Yeah, you, you, that's not petty. Because, because now I'm getting into you. Now you want to bring bring no, up the rules. Those are the rules. Okay. Okay. All right. The second okay. rebuttal. Well, that you established. Rebuttal. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Well, anyway, uh, so we're going back to his first uh, his first affirmative. He interrupted me, so I gotta get two more minutes. He, he, uh, his first affirmative, uh, his, uh, his negative construct was that Colossians two. Now, now, now I'm going back to your first negative con uh, construct. Colossians two was uh, directed toward the uh, uh, to the people of God and uh, uh, about keep uh, not being judged in in uh, keeping Sabbath in regard to holy days. Well, first of all. Uh, thing is, there's only two ways that particular verse can go. It's either talking about people who are keeping it or people who are not keeping it. And you have to read the text and decide for yourself uh, who he's talking to. Would he be talking to people who didn't even, don't even know what these things are? Would he be talking to any of you who do not keep those things? No, he was talking to the church who was actually operating in those things. And they were being judged for doing it. Because it goes on to say later on in the chapter that uh, it's a shadow, these are shadow of things to come. And... Um, and that the um, that the the enemy was creeping in at that time already. So this is something that we're dealing with in uh, Colossians two that Damon brought up. That is, uh, uh, you have to decide whether it's talking to the church or talking to those who don't keep the Sabbath. All right, I'm done. Go ahead. You're cutting your time from there. I'm cutting my time from there, but I want to say something. I want to say something. Hold on. The thing is, is that. Um, uh, if Damon has to make a point, let the moderator interrupt or do that. You interrupted my time and interrupted my flow. And you did that, you did that on purpose because I, was, because I was getting at you. Don't do that, man. Don't do that. Let the moderator. You're interrupting. He's making movements. He's interrupting my flow, Jay. Okay? I got you. I think, okay. uh, I think, the, point, uh, I think the point was that you were addressing something. That I, I understand this point. I, I get what you're saying, but I but have he, a mute as he well. He needs to do that when it's his turn to talk. You know what I mean? Not interrupt me. I got you. I, I got to catch that earlier. I hear what you're saying. He's not the moderator. You can't do that. All right, okay. We're going to go to him for a moment. All right, go ahead. All right, before you go, uh, Pastor Damon, I want to make sure that we are all on the same page and we understand, again, uh, what the expectation is. So that was... You already did your first rebuttal. This first, this second rebuttal now goes to the first rebuttal. 
I want to make sure we're all on the same page in regards to uh, what's supposed to be addressed at this time. Okay. All right. All right. So we get your seven minutes together. And uh, Pastor Damon, it is on you. All right. So my rebuttal is to his second rebuttal. And in his second rebuttal, he attempted to use uh, Colossians 2, 15 to 17, and you'll see his point failed. So again, number one, he doesn't establish that anybody has kept the Sabbath prior to it giving to being given to Israel. He has not established that yet. Uh, he is assuming that in scripture. Uh, number two, he has not proven that any Gentile beyond the Israelites, any Gentile believer in the Messiah has observed the Sabbath. And by observing the Sabbath, we are not talking about they met on a Sabbath day. We are talking about them observing the Sabbath, that is ceasing from their labor. He has not proven that. Colossians 2, 16 says, therefore, let don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. And so here's the important thing. You'll notice that the Colossian church has both Jew and Gentile in it. He brought the point up. And so let's clear it up. The Gentiles here are not under any expectation to culturally do as Jews done. And so Paul, specifically referring to them, says, don't let anybody judge you in regards to what you will eat or drink, that is, any of any dietary laws, or when you drink, that is, the, the day you drink it, or actually what you drink, the day you eat, or what you eat, let no man judge you in that. And then he further says, on the matters of a festival or a new moon. Now, this is the interesting thing. Uh, the, the word here, uh, eating and drinking, or food and drink, uh, it is the Greek word brosis and prosis. It is the same word that is used in Romans chapter 14, verse 17, where Paul says the kingdom of God is not meat or drink. It is not brosis or prosis, but it is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And, and, and so we can see clearly here that all of the things that were particular to the Jews, as in their dietary laws, or when they ate certain things, uh, was not to be uh, put upon the Gentile believers in Christ as an obligation. And Paul clearly says these things were a shadow, again, a skia, not the thing, but that which is representing the thing. But then he says, but that the body or the soma is Christ. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 12? He says, come to me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Paul is agreeing with Jesus. Jesus is the body of the Sabbath, not a day. And, and so this is why Paul is telling the Gentile believers, don't allow any man to judge you on that particular matter. And so uh, 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 the gentleman here from Virginia has failed in at every turn to establish, he's merely making assertions and claims, but he is not establishing from the scripture where in scripture Gentile believers in Christ are required to keep the Sabbath. I want you to keep that in mind. I want you to pay attention to not his sleight of hand, but his sleight of tongue, because he has, he has uh, done a whole lot of dancing and talking, but he has failed to show where it is required under the new covenant. And, and, and showing scriptures where Jews kept the Sabbath are, 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 are but everything that you would expect them to do as Jews. Where are the Gentile believers in the New Testament required to keep the Sabbath? Where are those scriptures, uh, Jermaine? Where are they? Where is it commanded? Where are the two or three texts in the New Testament commanding them to keep the obligatory Sabbath? You have not done that, sir. You have failed in this debate to establish your position. You have simply talked all around the text, but you have not gone to the text in the New Testament in particular or even the Old Testament to show that anybody other than Israel kept the Sabbath. 
And so the burden, the onus is still on you to establish your case up to this point. You have not. We have established clearly from scripture that Paul has said that this was just a shadow. Uh, over in Galatians, he says that it was worldly elements. Uh, that word stoichia literally means elementary things. It means ABCs. He said that they were tutors and governors until Christ should come. And so the law was anticipating Christ. Christ, who is the Sabbath, has, has made it so that when we are in Christ, we have rest in him. And it is not a day that we are keeping the Sabbath. In fact, the word tutors is pedagogos. This is, this is a tutor or a trainer of a boy until he comes to maturation. And so when a boy becomes mature and becomes a man, the boy was not destroyed. The boy just became a man. What happened? The, the maturation is a fulfillment of everything that was anticipated in his development. When Christ came, which is what the law was anticipating, all of the things in the law have gone away because they were just tutors instructing us until Christ should come, which is what he says in Galatians, that the law was given until the seed should come. And so what you have done, my friend, is you have missed the fact that the Sabbath is embodied in a person rather than a day. And so you are attempting to play with the elementary things when we are playing with the mature things. And what did Paul say? When I was a child, I did what children do. I even talked like a child. But, 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 but when I became older, and that is what Christ represents. He represents the fulfillment of all that was being anticipated in the law. I have now perfect Sabbath in him because he is the Sabbath, not a day. A day is an incomplete picture or skia representation of what the Soma actually is. That's, your, that's your time, sir. Friend. That's your time. That's your time. Thank you. So, uh, Brother Jermaine, this is your opportunity to rebuttal uh, his rebuttal, sir. Rebuttal is rebuttal, okay. Well, one of the things that Damon said was, he said, where is it commanded to keep the Sabbath in the New Testament? Well, I would have to ask the same question regarding a few other things. Where is it commanded that homosexuality is uh, not, not right in the New Testament? Where is that commanded? Where is it commanded that tithes and offering should be collected in the New Testament? Where is it commanded that uh, you know, you shall not murder in the New Testament. The, the commandments are in the Old Testament. The law is the instruction, the Torah. You know that very well, Damon. The law does not have to be repeated over and over again. How many times does God have to say something before it's established? And not to mention, even though the Sabbath is not particularly commanded, it's mentioned in every, every circumstance. So to rebut that, I say, it was commanded in the beginning. It doesn't have to be commanded again for it to be law because we keep laws from the Old Testament that we want to keep and that we uh, consider to be valuable. And those laws have not been recommanded. So that, 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 is a, that, that is an irrelevant point. And Damon does a lot of this fancy talking, guys, but he's saying nothing. You know, he talks fancy, guys, but he's saying nothing. I'm just more down to earth. You know, I just talk like, like, it's, like it's regular, you know. But, the, you know, uh, uh, the thing is that that's the point he's making there. Now, he... Uh, he goes on to say uh, something about Jesus embodying the, 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 the day. So you, a couple of weeks ago, he was arguing about modalism, you know, and about trying to uh, put, trying to, trying to put forward, trying to put forward, see, you're interrupting me, trying to put forward a, a, a situation where something is substituting. A day and Christ are two different things. God was God when he created the day. So he could have fulfilled the den if he wanted to. What, what, what type of doctrine or teaching is that? Now, he says, I didn't give you any scripture. Let me just read a passage. I wasn't trying to read passages because I, I don't have much time. If we were doing a Bible study, I would sure enough lay it out. But really quickly here in, in Acts 17, it says, verse 1, it says, Now when they had passed through uh, Amphilippus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. And where um, there, there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, you hear synagogue of the Jews and you say, oh, this is Jewish. Remember. The oracles of God were given to them first. 
Nobody had scripture. Nobody had church according to the Bible before them. So that's where you had to go. Just like when Damon was a Muslim, he had to come to the uh, to the Christians to get the word. You have to do that. You have to go to who the source is. So they were only going there because of the source, all right? These were the first converts. The first converts were Jews. So they met in the synagogues. Then Paul, as it was his custom, as it was the custom of Paul. Now notice Jesus as it was his custom. So now you have Jesus and Paul, Jesus in, 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 uh, in Luke 4, 16, now Paul here in Acts 17, saying it was their practice. I'm sure Damon could give us some Greek on that to clarify that that means it was a practice. And where do you see any other practice? Where do you see validation for your Sunday keeping? It's not here. So the thing is, you see, then Paul, as it was accustomed, went to them three Sabbaths, reasoned with them in the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that Christ had to suffer. So he's given the gospel message, uh, going along, then Jesus who I preach is the Christ to you, uh, to you is Christ. And some of them were persuaded, a great multitude of them, devout Greeks, and not a few leading women joined Paul and Silas. So you had Gentiles there on the Sabbath. Every example in scripture if there is a day of worship, it's going to be on the Sabbath. And that's all I'm saying. I don't have to use all these fancy things and try to, you know, sound intelligent. It's written in the scripture. Everything is done on the Sabbath. You go over to Acts 18. Let me read this scripture. How much time do I have left? Three minutes. Three minutes. I got plenty of time. All right. Uh, Acts 18. This is Acts of the Apostle, the beginning of the church. Acts 18, verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. You guys know Aquila and Priscilla. We know them, right? Through them in Manila. All right, verse 3. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, and uh, for by, by occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Now, my point is here, persuaded both Jews and Greeks. We have three examples now. I gave you Acts 13, I gave you Acts 17, and also Acts well, 4, Acts 16 as well. Why does it say Sunday? Because according to Damon's teaching, this, the first day of the week was established. Why don't you see any of that here with the Jews or the Greeks? Think about that. It's just Protestant and Catholic ethos that, 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 we're, that we're driving from, things that we were taught by tradition. The scripture does not show anything different. And this is the problem that people like us have. And then we're called cults and all this other stuff, you know. No, this is what the word of God says. Now, look, it goes on to say uh, that uh, he reads the Sabbath, uh, every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Here at, at, in the fourth verse. Where do you see anything else? Where do you see anything else about the Sabbath? So I, I've established, he's saying I haven't established my point. No, I haven't established it as eloquently as he has. I haven't come by excellency of speech and deceiving and the swelling words, but by the demonstration of power, by truth and understanding. There is nothing else in, uh, nothing else in the scripture that can be proved. How much time, Jay? One minute. One minute. Nothing else in the scripture that can be proven outside of this fact. Jesus did not sacrifice, he did not substitute himself for the Sabbath day. He said he was the Lord of the Sabbath. He didn't say he was the Sabbath. You're adding in the scripture. That's not what the word of God says. The Sabbath was made for man. Point blank period. Jesus kept it. Paul kept it. And we go on to, into the future. Isaiah 66 and 23, future prophecy shows that all flesh. I'll put this in your notes. Isaiah 66, 22 to 23 says, and from new moon, new moon, and Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh will come to worship before me. It doesn't say Sunday. It doesn't say Wednesday, Tuesday. This is a prophecy of the millennial kingdom, is it not? Respond to that. Is that not a prophecy of the millennial kingdom? That's about the coming of Christ. So the future even shows an order, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his law shall go forth from Zion. So that's, that's the establishment of the Sabbath. It doesn't have to be recommanded, just like homosexuality, the homosexuality doesn't, or tithes and offering. It's established from the beginning. I'm done. Now this is this is the dangerous part uh, <laughs> because I'm unmuting both of you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, this is this is what we're gonna do. Um, I opened it up on our Facebook commentary for people to ask questions, and there's been a little bit there's been more comments than questions, um, and so one of the things we'll do we'll give people an opportunity. But since in your presentations, both of you had questions as well for each other, I want to give you guys a chance to ask each other one question. And you'll get three minutes to answer the question. And then if you want to rebut it, you'll get three minutes to rebuttal the question 
uh, or the answer from your question. Is that fair? All right, that's fair. All right, either one of you have a preference on who goes first? I'll go first since I uh, am the uh, negative constructive. Is that cool with you, Brother Jermaine? That's fine, that's fine. Okay, cool. Go ahead, you got, uh, you can ask your question. All right, so I, I, uh, the gentleman here from Virginia uh, has attempted to say that the Sabbath uh, is a moral law uh, like the other nine in the Ten Commandments, right? So, so of course, um, lying or committing adultery, murder, all those things are uh, stealing, all those things are moral issues. The Sabbath, however, is ceremonial. It is not moral. And so my question then is this, in Isaiah 1, 13 through 14, in Hosea 2, 11, and in Lamentations 2 and 6, God orders Israel to stop their Sabbaths. In fact, he even says that they are detestable to me. I hate them in Isaiah 1, 13, uh, in uh, Hosea 2 and 11. I will put an end to all of their celebrations, new moons and Sabbaths. And in uh, Lamentations uh, 2 and 6, uh, it says the very same thing. Uh, tells them to cease their Sabbaths. And so here's the thing. If the Sabbath is a moral law, where in Scripture do you find God actually telling Israel not to keep any of the moral commandments? In other words, telling them to uh, telling them that it is okay to steal, telling them that it is okay to lie, telling them that it is okay to bear false witness, it is okay to commit adultery. Where do you find, if the Sabbath is moral, and we find here God telling Israel to stop the Sabbath, where do you find God giving Israel any commandment to stop being moral? All right. Where do you so, find that in scripture? Are you clear on the question, Brother Jermaine? Uh, yeah, I'm clear on the question. The, the, uh, I'm clear on the question. All right. So it's on you. You got three minutes. Okay. So um, the thing is, Damon addressed the point of why did God command Israel to stop the feast? And I want to answer that part of the question first. Notice in the particular passage, he says... Uh, no, no, no. You have to answer the question, my friend. Answer the question. I'm answering the question. Would you tell him to stop interrupting? No, no, no. Not giving exegesis let of him, the verse. Answer the I'm answering the question through the scripture. It's all yours. I'm giving you your three minutes. You see what I'm saying? Calm down, bro. You got three minutes. That's right. Pastor That's right. Pastor. So That's like I said, in, in Exodus, the, the, the answer to, to answer his question, why did God tell them to do this? Is because the, in the scripture, I have to go to the scripture to answer it. He says it's their feast. It's not his feast. Now, Leviticus, and Leviticus, he says... This is a whole, these, these are my feasts. Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, God pronounces it to oh, Moses speak to people that these are my feasts. So I'm answering the question, Damon. These are, the, the feast of God is or when the feasts are done correctly according to the word of God. They were doing things contrary to the scripture. Jesus in John 7 says, Moses gave you a law and none of you are doing it. He said, but in vain, Mark 7 and 7, in vain do you worship me, teaching for, for doctrine the commandments of men. In essence, they're doing what many people are doing now, adding to the word of God, bringing all these different types of doctrines in that are not scriptural. Now, we went through all of this stuff here so far, and, uh, you know, we see very clearly that uh, some of these things that, you know, we, we're arguing about the Sabbath. Of no time has anybody validated Sunday yet, you know? So, I'm, so my thing is, and that's, that's a part of your question. The thing is, is that, they they belong to them and that's why he did it because it wasn't it wasn't his feast they had changed it through uh their traditions you know how the pharisees were they added things on the scripture just like what jesus uh, was uh ate before uh not washing his hands even though that's a good practice it's not scriptural they were throwing they were throwing things on the uh on the word of god that weren't scriptural and that's why god he detested them he said your feast because they weren't his anymore they took them over just like uh uh, you know, other people do today. So that, hopefully that answers your question. He's getting mad over there. He's shaking his head. He's doing all this stuff. Notice how upset he's getting. So, <laughs> Calm down, bro. So Calm down. You have your turn. So, so this is what we're going to do. One of the things, especially Pastor Damon, I need you to do. If he's answering your question and you feel he's not answering it, you just got to sit back for a second and relax and your movements can throw him off because he's going to focus on whatever you're doing. 
So we're going to give you an opportunity to rebuttal what he answered and in the manner in, in which you want. And then we'll go back to Brother Jermaine to ask you a question that you'll get to answer. All right. So, so it's you. on me. Yes, sir. OK, so 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 again, what I'm what I'm what I'm demonstrating here is, is that Jermaine is not answering any questions. He is making assertions and claims, but not answering questions. So he goes to do an attempted exegesis uh, of the selected text that I gave. But my question was, if the Sabbath is a moral law like the other nine, where in scripture do you find God telling Israel to stop being moral as in the other nine moral commands? But you do find God telling Israel to stop the Sabbath. If, if the Sabbath was moral, it would not be hated or detested by God. The moral law flows from God's character. It flows from his moral nature. The Sabbath is a ceremonial law. Hence, God detested their practice of it. There's no scripture where you can find that God actually detested the practice of anybody's morality. It doesn't exist in scripture. And that was the question that I asked you. That was the question that you really sidestepped uh, by attempting to just explain what it meant. But that's not what I asked you. And, and, and so again, you have not done that this whole debate. You have attempted to read scriptures time and again where Jews are keeping the Sabbath. You are attempting to assert that worshiping on the Sabbath meant that Gentile believers in Christ were actually observing the Sabbath according to what observing the Sabbath means. And yet none of those scriptures are actually saying that. You are imposing that interpretation upon the scripture. Acts 17, Paul preached in Athens. It says in the synagogue to the Jews, it literally says that. And then it says those that worship God. You know who they are? Those are the proselytes. Those are the Gentile converts to Judaism. Then he preached to the other people in the marketplace who were working on the Sabbath. Why? Because it was a convenient day to catch them. None of that in the scripture says anything about Gentiles being obligated to keep the Sabbath. You have not done what you, what you were tasked to do in this debate. You have not shown anywhere where they were commanded, where they required. And that is the name of the debate, consequently, are Christians required to keep the Sabbath? You need to show where they are required. And you have made a lot of assertions and claims and done a lot of proof texting and eisegesis, but you have not, you have not proven your case tonight. All right, thank you. So we're gonna go uh, to you, Brother Jermaine. Uh, what is your question uh, for Pastor Damon? Uh, my question for Pastor Damon is, uh, uh, he is an expert, uh, an expert in um, uh, Greek, uh, and I want him to please give the audience the understanding of Hebrews 4 and 9, the Greek uh, in Hebrews 4 and 9. Uh, yeah, that's my question. Hebrews 4 and 9. What is, what is the Greek word there, and what does it mean? All right. One moment, please. Hang on. Put him on okay. let, me, let me pull that up. Okay. Um, Once you pull it up, let me know so I can start your time. And please, just don't, you don't have to uh, do an exegesis or you, 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 matter of fact, you can do whatever you want, but just answer the question. Don't, I, I, the, I just want you to tell you what the Greek is. What does the Greek mean? All right. So you got it? Uh, no, hang on. I'm pulling it up now. All right. Uh, but um, let me, let me say this. The question is not clear. W what specific question are you asking me? What Greek word in particular? I'm asking you to translate, since it was not clear, I asked you the word in Hebrews 4 and 9, for, I'm sorry, I, I didn't say that, you're right. Hebrews 4 and 9, the word rest. You're right, the word rest. The word rest in Hebrews 4 and 9, what is the Greek on the word rest in Hebrews 4 and 9? That's my question. That's your question? Yes, my question. It, it's just for me to give you the Greek word. Hey, and, tell, and, and give me the Greek word and tell us what it means. The, the, word, the, the Greek word there is sabbatosmos. Uh, and it means rest. 
and, and so and so here's the interesting thing. Uh, the word the word sabbatosmos, as is translated from Shabbat from the LXX, uh, is literally used over 200 times in scripture. Uh, literally, only a handful of those times does it actually refer to the seventh day or the day of rest. The word sabbatosmos simply means rest. It means to cease from labor. And, and in most cases where the word in the Greek is used in the LXX, it actually doesn't have anything to do with the actual Sabbath day, but has everything to do with just ceasing. Uh, that is, uh, in fact, uh, in, in Exodus, uh, Pharaoh accused Moses of wanting to take the Israelites out of Egypt so that they could rest from their work. It's that same word, sabbatosmos. Was, was uh, Pharaoh accusing Moses of wanting to keep the Sabbath? Absolutely not. What he was saying is, you just want to take them out of here so they'll no longer have to work. So the reality is, is that the word sabbatosmos in the Greek simply means to cease from work and does not specifically refer to the Sabbath unless the context actually refers to that. And in this particular, and in this particular text, there is a greater Sabbath to come, and that Sabbath is not a day if you are reading that according to the context. All right. This is your opportunity, uh, Brother Jermaine, to rebuttal that. Okay, I want to rebuttal that by exposing uh, the error of that, that whole uh, section there. First of all, the word is sabbatismos, and it does not mean simply rest in the Greek. It means a Sabbath rest or a Sabbath keeping. Now I want the listeners, because he's going to go back and forth about what he's establishing. And I'm doing this and Jermaine is not establishing, but I want to establish it in your personal knowledge. I want you to go to your interlinear and look that word up, it's Sabbatismos, and it means a Sabbath keeping or a Sabbath rest. The word in the Greek in the other parts of the passages is catapulsis in the Greek. And that is where we get pause from. Paul made a distinctive uh, uh, point here to make sure he wrote there remain a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. And the sleight of hand of the uh, King James uh, Anglican uh, Catholic, whoever they were, or the translators put, you know, there the are a lot of sections where they, they, they did some bad translations. And don't get me wrong, I, I read the King James versions. I, we're not supporting uh, people uh, tearing down our Bibles, but you do have to go back and cover some of the Greek and Hebrew for yourself, all right, in some of these translations. Now, Damon was erroneous in saying that, number one, that it was uh, uh, meaning uh, rest and is used because this particular form of sabbatismos, it only occurs one time in the whole Bible, and that's here. Sabbatismos, a Sabbath keeping, this is the only occurrence. Now, if you don't agree with me, or you don't believe me, rather, look it up in the, the concordance yourself. This is the only usage of this word, one time. So therefore, all of that fancy speaking, all of that uh, trying to give us something uh, was establishing nothing. This is a particular word. And the reason why I brought this up was to show that this is a clear example of a sleight of hand by the writers and by the, Prot the Protestant Catholic ethos to throw us off from some of the things in scripture. This scripture says, literally says, therefore there remains a Sabbath keeping for the people of God. Now, you don't believe that? Go to Hebrews 4 and 9, look it up and see what it means for yourself. I'm done. Thank you. All right. Um, we, go here. we have a question. We have a question from one of our viewers. Uh, directed to Pastor Damon, and then uh, Brother Jermaine, you'll have a chance to uh, rebuttal it or answer uh, on your own. But the question for you, uh, Pastor Damon, is, and this is from Richardson Kelly, can you accurately define the word Gentile in this text? And he read Romans 9, 23, and verse 24 in the King James Version. I'm sorry, uh, you said it was uh, Romans. Romans 9, verse 23 through 24 in the King James Version. Can you accurately define the word Gentile in this text? All right, let me pull that up. Hang on just a second. All right, give me just a second here. Uh, and the text again was Romans 9, 23. Romans 9, 23. 
Romans 9, 23, 24. Okay. All right. Just a second. And that he might make known the riches of the glory of him upon the vessels of mercy, uh, which he hath prepared uh, in advance for his glory. And verse 24, uh, whom even he has called us not only out from the Jews, but also out from uh, the Gentiles. Uh, so he wants me to do what? To, de to define the word there for Gentiles? The Gentiles were according to that script from those verses. The, 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 the Gentiles there, uh, the Greek word there is ethnon, uh, and it means the nations, the nations as in those who were separate and distinct uh, ethnically from, from the Jews. So that means everybody other than a Jew. That's, that's what that means in the text. It's as simple as that. <clears throat> that's it? I mean, that's, that's all he asked for. What's okay. the definition of the word yeah, Gentile? Yeah. I just want to make sure you would, that's it. Oh, okay, yeah. Brother Jermaine, would you like to uh, respond to that at all or answer that? Or I mean, that, that has no relevance at all to this uh, debate. You know, I mean, uh, the meaning of the word Gentiles, uh, unless we were dealing with the uh, Hebrew Israelites and, you know, you know, they would like to say that Gentiles means uh, Israel, uh, you know, scattered around the diaspora. So and around the world. So that has no relevance to this debate. I have nothing to really comment on that. But Damon's uh, accurate about that, that definition. Yeah. Yeah. My assumption in select in, in well, one, that was like the only question on here. But two, uh, my, my assumption was that they were applying that because of the statement of uh, was the Sabbath for uh, the Gentiles because oh, they okay. had asked that question. Okay. So maybe trying to find out who the Gentiles were. My oh. that, you know, okay. All right. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, we have another question. Tiandra story. Can Damon please respond to the Greek word sabbatismos? So they wanted oh, to hear gotcha. your response so, to that. Right. So, so, and then, uh, and then, and then we'll give Brother Jermaine the same opportunity to rebuttal if he likes. Okay. Yeah. So, so, um, uh, well, number one, admittedly, uh, Jermaine doesn't know Greek. Uh, so, so he thinks that he made a point, but he didn't make a point. And so, so, so the word sabbatismos. Uh, is a variant, uh, it is a rare variant indeed, but it is a variant of the word sabaton, and sabaton uh, is, is the root word. It is the word that is most commonly used uh, in the uh, Greek LXX, the Sep Septuagint, uh, and that's what I was referring to. So when I said sabatismos is used throughout uh, the LXX, I was actually right, uh, but that is in its root form, and that is sabaton. It doesn't mean anything different from sabaton in this verse. And so what Jermaine is looking at is the form of it in the verse, but the form of it doesn't change the meaning. And if he knew any Greek, he would know that sabatismos and sabaton mean exactly the same thing. And in the context, he says, there yet remains a rest for the people of God. Let us therefore enter into that rest. It does not say anything about what we should do on the day of the Sabbath. It says enter into the rest and entering into the rest according to the Hebrew writer is in Christ because of course you will know that the purpose of the writing of the book of Hebrew is antitypical. It means that Christ is the antitype or the great fulfillment of all of the types of the Old Testament and shadows of which even the Sabbath was a type in the shadow. We already read Paul say that in Colossians. You denied that he said that. He said Christ is the body of it, right? And, and so he said that. And, and so the writer of Hebrews is saying the same thing. Entering into the rest is entering into Christ by faith. And that, my friend, is not keeping a day. And furthermore, he says, if Joshua uh, had given them rest, he would have never spoken of another day. Well, the fact is, is that they were given the command to keep the Sabbath before Joshua. So, so what is in view here, my friend, is not a day of rest, but it is a spiritual rest 
that is embodied and encapsulated in the person of Christ. And so had you done next to Jesus on Hebrews chapter four, you would know that, that that same verse that you selected actually backfires on your theology. All right. So now we're going to our brother Jermaine. Yes. Rebuttal. Thank you, brother. Well, I mean, Damon is just dancing around the fact that he was wrong. Uh, the thing is, is that um, I, I don't claim to be fluent in Greek, but I do know quite a few Greek words because I have a strong concordance just like you do. And when I, I have learned to look up words in scriptures, I don't speak Greek fluently. I doubt that Damon can speak it fluently, but I do have enough resources and all of you can have the same type of uh, 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 resources too. All you got to do is go to go online, go to Bible Hub, go to get, get your strongest Greek concordance and you can look up everything. That's how we validate the scripture is uh, uh, is. Um, is, uh, you know, our textual criticism. We have that established and validates our faith. Our Bible is strong because we have the Greek and the Hebrew behind behind it in the uh, manuscripts. So uh, the point that Damon is trying to make that sabbaton, sabbaton means something different. It is the same root word, but sabbatismos, as you look from the, the scholarly work, because Damon is scholarly, all scholarly work will verify, look it up for yourselves, that it means a Sabbath keeping. It does not mean rest. If that was the case, then the word Sabbath, Sabbatismos would have been put in the text. It would have been a catapulsis like the rest of the words in the text. That is the only occurrence because Paul is making a specific point. I would uh, uh, strongly uh, suggest that you look that up for yourself. And like I said, Damon is a, uh, he's, 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 he's really, uh, really slick with it. But um, he, he can't talk his way out of that one. Look it up for yourselves, and then you come back, and uh, those of y'all know him uh, can chastise him for that for that uh, that error there. Um, but uh, I never claimed to speak Greek fluently, but I, I do know quite a bit of Greek from my study, and I do exegese scripture every time I go uh, go into it, uh, despite Damon's claim. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah. All right, we have a question directed to you, Brother Jermaine, yes. uh, from Tim Fuller. And then uh, we'll give brother, uh, Pastor Damon, if he wants a chance to rebuttal or answer the question. The question from Tim Fuller is, to Jermaine, if the believers are to keep the Sabbath, mm. how are believers to keep it to be in line with the way they observed it in the scripture? All right. Well, great question. And I'll answer that for you. Uh, number one, you have, you guys all know Exodus 20 uh, with the Ten Commandments, and he gives a layout of how we shouldn't do our regular work there. He says, you shall, uh, six days you shall work and the seventh day is the Sabbath because God rested. So you rest like your God rests. I mean, it's a pretty simple concept. God didn't just create the Israelites, he created everybody. So everybody's resting like God, okay? And being like the Father, being like Christ. But how you do that, you, you put away from your, you know, your, your job. Now, some, some jobs, of course, won't allow you to do that. So you have to, uh, I'm not telling everybody to go out and quit your job. You know what I mean? But the thing is, is that you have to wait for God to open the opportunity. We're not in Israel. So the opportunity is not always open. But you would uh, start by keeping the Sabbath if you can. Uh, uh, you know, and then also Isaiah, the uh, 58th chapter, gives a um, uh, particular uh, understanding of how exactly to keep it. It says, uh, uh, Isaiah 58 and 13 says, if you turn your foot uh, from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, uh, and call the Sabbath a delight, a holy day uh, honorable, and uh, shall honor him, not doing your own ways. Again, the Sabbath is about honoring God. It's, a, it's made for man to spend time with God, not finding your own pleasure. This means going out to the ball games and doing all this other stuff. We incorporate things. Now, we don't put a pharmaceutical pharisaical type of burden on it. That's what they did. And you can do things on the Sabbath. We go to the museum. We do things related to studying, understanding, worship of God. You know, there's certain movies we can watch. You know, there's nothing in scripture that says you can't do certain things on the Sabbath, you know, uh, but it's basically to separate time dedicated to God and to rest. So he says here, from doing your own pleasure, no speaking your own words. So you're not involved in a whole lot of secular stuff, things that you would do on other days, uh, because it's holy, set apart. Uh, then uh, you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of your father, of Jacob, your father. Now, how could that be limited to the Old Testament? The heritage of Jacob is, is uh, through, through Abraham. That's an eternal, eternal blessing. The Sabbath is eternally blessed, eternally blessed. And I will say another thing, in keeping these Sabbaths, brothers and sisters, there's a blessing that's added to your understanding. It may not make you uh, so theologically sound, but spiritual understanding of how to worship God, it will help you get there. So that's how you do it. You put, it, put away work and you try to focus on godly things, whether you're going out with the family, whatever it may do, you know, have friends over, break bread, whatever, you know, study some scripture and, um, 
That's basically it. There's nothing, nothing too burdensome about it. So my commandments are not burdensome, you know? So everybody thinks the Sabbath is a big burden, but it's really not. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we go to you, Pastor Damon. All right. Would you re read that uh, question again? Question is, uh, if believers are to keep the Sabbath, how are believers to keep it to be in line with the way they observed it in Scripture? Well, well, the, the, the question is framed with misunderstanding. Believers in Christ are not to keep the Sabbath because we have the Sabbath. And so here's how we actually keep it by living holy in Christ. It is, it is the work of the Holy Spirit and sanctification in the believer that causes us to actually enter into that rest in Christ. When we are justified by faith, we enter into that rest in Christ. When we are being sanctified, that is by the work of the Holy Spirit, we are actually living in that rest. And so, and so that is how the new covenant believer is to actually keep the Sabbath because it is not a day. It is the person of Christ. He is the Sabbath. He said, I will give you rest. He said, I will give it to you. And again, Paul says in Colossians 2 that the Sabbath days and the feast days were a shadow. They were the skia. But Christ is the body. He is the soma. He is what the shadow is pointing to. And so for the New Testament believer, when we are justified by faith, that is when we receive salvation, we enter into the rest that is in Christ. And of course, the work of sanctification uh, that, or sanctification, which is the work of the Holy Spirit, causes us to actually live in that rest as we are being formed uh, in Christ. Uh, and so that is how the believer is actually uh, to keep the Sabbath. It is, not a, it is not an observance anymore. That was child's play, according to Paul in Galatians. He said those things were the elements or the elementary things. Uh, stokia, again, uh, your, your fundamentals, your ABCs, until Christ should come. And so when we have Christ, we no longer need to, uh, that, and, and uh, it, it is not for the believer to have to keep a day. It is for the believer to actually enter into that rest. The other part of it is, again, you is got 20 that, seconds. Good. The Sabbath, again, was given to Israel. Keep that in mind. It was inextricably connected to their bondage in Egypt and God's deliverance of them. No Gentile. No non-Jewish person can claim that their ancestors were enslaved in Egypt. And so the Sabbath you, was that's a your, sign of that. That's your time. Thank you. All right. Uh, now, we have a few questions that are kind of directed more to you, uh, Brother Jermaine. So you're going to have to put your overseer hat on for a moment uh, because there are a couple of questions. And they're kind of smaller, but i give you this one. Uh, what is the Pastor Gary Knight and asked this question? What is the penalty for not keeping the Sabbath today? All right. Well, first of all, uh, I forgot the, the last question. I forgot to mention something. Uh, I forgot to mention the Sabbath is also a holy convocation. I forgot to mention that point. Leviticus 23, other than the rest and the not doing the whole thing, you are commanded to convocate. That's called in Leviticus 23. I don't want to put that out there because the person asked the question. All right. Now, uh, regarding this question. Uh, what is the penalty? Well, in the Old Testament, the penalty for repetitively not keeping the Sabbath was ultimately death. You would be, you would be, uh, you know, killed from the camp, all right, and cut off from your people. Now, like Damon has ex explained, and I, I absolutely agree, the Old Testament is a bunch of typology to spiritual things. We don't disagree with that. But has all spiritual things been fulfilled? Have Christ come back yet to fulfill that day? It's still seven days of the week. It was not like we we're in eternity, so we still have days set apart. You know, you guys easily do Sunday and holidays, Christmas, and but then the Sabbath and the holy days, which are biblical, are left out. So the penalty from keep from from missing the Sabbath is a spiritual cutoff. There's a certain spiritual boundary or blindness that will be there with not keeping the Sabbath. First Corinthians, the uh, second chapter. Or, or rather, Second Corinthians, the second chapter goes into the veil remaining at the reading of the Old Covenant. See, when you don't keep the Sabbath, you can't really understand the Old Testament and its spiritual meaning. You can't understand how Christ fulfilled it, how he magnified the law. Isaiah 42 said he will come to magnify the law, not to diminish. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law. He said not one jot or tittle shall pass away. 
So how then can the Sabbath be passed away from, from what we're doing today? So uh, the, the answer to your question directly, uh, once again, it's a matter of spiritual cutoff. There's a spiritual blindness uh, that's there. Psalm 111 and 10 says, a good understanding have all those that keep his commandments. When you start studying and, and keeping the Sabbath and keeping the holy, God blessed it. He sanctified it. So there's something that's added to you. Now, you may be blessed from other things you do that you keep of the law. You know, like I said, Gentiles keep a law, uh, it's a, a law of themselves. You know, they receive blessings. If you don't commit adultery, guess what? It'll make your marriage better. If you don't rob or steal, you, you, you won't have to endure so much, you know, you won't be going to jail. So, you know, you don't commit murder, you won't go to jail. So there's natural blessings that come with keeping the word of God. But when you violate any of the word of God, there is a penalty. Sabbath specifically is a spiritual uh, law, not like the other commandments. Uh, graven images, having other gods before God, those are spiritual. Now, it's like that. If you do those things, what's going to happen? What do you think is going to happen if you have graven images? What do you think? You, what's going to happen if you put other gods before God? You know, if you, if you, if you take the Lord's name in vain, that which which preachers like Damon are doing, you claiming to be a preacher of the gospel, but you, you're preaching against the gospel. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. Well, there's a spiritual cutoff and punishment for that. So that's what I would say about that. And But the thing is, God is gracious. He's merciful. He's patient. So he's looking for teachers to come out and break this word that we move forward from this Protestant and Catholic ethos. Because that's where we got it from. There's no way in scripture that shows anything else but the Sabbath. Even if you want to argue that you didn't, under, you know, where else, where, what, what else is there? Do you see Sunday in here validated as a holy day? You would have to prove that. So therefore, when you deny the Sabbath, you cut off spiritual understanding. That's that's the answer. All right, uh, Pastor Damon, you want to reply to that? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, the the my laugh is the reply because um, uh, Jermaine here doesn't engage any of the text at all. In, in fact, I have read Colossians two fifteen to seventeen several times. I brought it up. He has not engaged that text because you know why? It clearly shows that Christ is, is the body of what the law was merely a skia or a shadow of. The reason he won't bother that is because he knows exactly what it says. So he wants to say that I'm saying it, but that's Paul's words. Uh, it's also interesting that he read 2 Corinthians 3. Uh, he referenced 2 Corinthians chapter 3, but I noticed that he, again, takes it out of context. So let me put it into context. Uh, for the gentleman from Virginia. It says in verse four, such is the confidence that we have in Christ before our God. Uh, it's, uh, I'm sorry, verse seven. Now, if the ministry that brought death chiseled in letters on stones, that's the Ten Commandments, came with glory so that the Israelites were not able to gaze steadily at Moses' face because of its glory, which was set aside or passing away. He says, <clears throat> how will the ministry of the spirit not be more glorious? For if the ministry that brought condemnation had glory, the ministry that brings righteousness overflows with even more glory. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory that surpasses it. So again, uh, this the overseer says that I don't know the gospel. What Paul just said here is that Christ has eclipsed the former glory. Paul used two words. He says, number one, that law, which was chiseled in stone, those are the Ten Commandments, have been set aside, one, passing away, two, and number three, it has been surpassed or eclipsed by a greater glory. And he says, what else is it? Well, that's how I know this guy doesn't know the gospel. What else is it? Christ is what else? He is all that there is. And if you knew Christ, you will know what the what else is. But in the mind of this guy, what else is it? But the Sabbath clearly shows that he doesn't understand the gospel because Christ is the end of the law. He is the fulfillment of it. He represents all that it was embodied. And so what has he done according to, according to Colossians? He nailed it on the cross and watch now, moved it out of our way. 
when he in his body was nailed to the cross, all, <clears throat> all that was written in the law was canceled. Paul, Paul uses the word abolished. 10 seconds. And it was canceled. So if you knew the gospel, you'd understand why we actually have true rest and him and the Sabbath day is out of our way. All right. Got a question. Uh, we have a question for, uh, for Pastor Damon um, from Morris Williams Jr. And then if you want to rebuttal it, our brother Jermaine, you can. This question is for uh, Pastor Damon. Okay. Is there any scripture that Christ said in his own words not to observe the Sabbath anymore? Is there any scripture that Christ says my death will take away any observance of feast days or Sabbath? Well, there are no scriptures where Christ said that, but we do find all of those scriptures in the new covenant, the new Testament letters. In fact, we just read a number of those scriptures. I don't know if whoever asked the question wasn't listening, but the text that I just read in second Corinthians chapter three uh, verses seven to 11 said that it has been surpassed. It has been moved out of the way. Uh, I read a scripture in Galatians four verses one through 11. In fact, Paul said to them that the law, which the, uh, with the, which of course the Sabbath was under were beggarly elements. They were tutors until Christ should come. And then Paul says this in verse eight, uh, verse nine, but now since you know God or rather have become known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and beggarly elements? Excuse me, or worthless elements. And then he says this, do you want to be enslaved to them all over again? And so he says to the non-Jewish believers, by attempting to go back and keep a law that was never intended for you to keep, you're actually going back and enslaving yourself. And he says, uh, you are, uh, uh, and he says, here's how they're enslaving themselves. You are observing special days, months, seasons, and years. And I am fearful for you that you are making waste of my labor. And so how were they actually wasting the labor of the gospel? By attempting to keep the law, particularly circumcision and the Sabbath and all of the things that were not ever given to them. And, and, and so the reality is, is that we've already read these scriptures. We've read Galatians 3. We've talked about that. Uh, the law was our guardian until Christ uh, came, came so that we could be justified by faith. And again, the guardian was a pedagogus, uh, a, a tutor, uh, helping the boy during his developmental stages. Well, what happens when the boy is mature and becomes a man? He no longer needs the pedagogus. Why? Because maturation is the fulfillment of his puberty. When Christ came, we no longer needed those things. We've already read uh, uh, Romans 14. We, 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 my goodness, we've already talked about all of these scriptures, Colossians 2, 16 through 17. All of these scriptures say in no uncertain terms that for believers in Christ who were not Jewish, they were specifically told you are under no obligation. Don't let anybody, specifically the Jewish followers of Christ, Three seconds. You on these matters because of your liberty in Christ. And so a person yeah, like Jermaine- I gotta pause you, sir. I gotta pause you. We're gonna go to you, Brother Jermaine. Uh, I'll let you respond to that, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, first and uh, foremost, uh, uh, Damon uh, re responds to that question, uh, referring to Colossians 2 and 6. The guy asks, the guy asks where does Jesus uh, you know, say out of his own mouth that these things, and that's true. Where does Christ say that? Where does anybody say it? Nobody says that. Now, the problem is, this is something that Peter wrote in, uh, in Second Peter. I can't remember exactly where, but Damon knows where it is. And some of you guys know where it is. It says that, uh, oh, you guys laughing at that? I don't know if you guys know where everything is, but I bet you it's in, I bet you it's in Second Peter, right? He says this, Paul wrote some things that were difficult to understand. Paul's writings are difficult. And maybe Damon can elaborate on why, but I would say this, uh, 
uh, uh, one thing that I that I do know is that talking about the law is a complicated situation. And one of the biggest problems and uh, that I would uh, have you to understand with reading those passages, number one is the translation. The translation of Galatians and Romans are terrible. Damon knows that clearly. There are there are definite articles. All right, no, there there are definite. All right, here's, let's prove it. Let's prove it. Here we go. I want everybody to take your notes. All right, take your notes. All right. Uh, and I'll give you the passages. The problem is, is that the Protestant uh, uh, and the Catholic Catholic translators, in this case, not Protestant, Catholic in this case, when they translated the Bible, they added things in. And, and Romans and Galatians, there's a lot of definite articles in there that makes it say the law. When really the scripture is saying works of law. It's referring to any type of law. When he says that uh, the, these handwritten things uh, were against you, he wasn't talking about the laws of God. How is he talking about the laws of God? The, the Bible says, David said in Psalm 101, that I, the, uh, blessed are they that seek not the counsel of the ungodly, but their delight is in the law of the Lord, and he shall be like a tree planted. God's law is perfect. The law of the Lord is perfect, enlightening the soul. All these scriptures about the positivity, positivity of the law. Uh, uh, Paul said in Romans 7, if it was not for the law, I would not have known what sin is. Let's understand this, brothers and sisters. The reason that this is bad not to keep the Sabbath and the laws, because Damon is basically saying that we, he's, he's, he made it clear that the laws have been abolished. He said there's no rules. Do you understand the insanity of that? If there is no law, there is nothing to govern anyone. So you're saying anything goes. How could you be a follower of God and the government of God with no law? That's what law is. First John 3 and 4 says sin is what? Let's define sin. Sin is the transgression of the law. Paul said, if it was not for the law, I would not know what sin is. So the law's function is to, is to give prophecy and to uh, define sin. And, you know, it, it's, it's not functioning by itself. Okay? So uh, uh, what, what was the question again? I forgot. 15 seconds. How much? 15 seconds? You got 15 seconds. Okay. Well, yeah. You know, so that, that's it. I don't remember the question now, but I'm human. Go ahead. Jesus, help me. Take the wheel. Right. <laughs> yeah. Don't try to play me, son. You know I've been sharp. Don't try to play me. I'm not. You, you already know. I'm human. I'm human. I forgot I'm the human. question. <laughs> I forgot the question. Damn, talk so long. I forget the questions. <laughs> it's all good. Man, I, I can't stay on task for you and me. You got That's right. Me. But you're not, you're not staying on task. You're struggling. Okay. Let's go here. This is another question. We'll have a what couple more. What point is he watching? All right. All right, fellas. Um, this is going to be for both you guys, so we'll go with uh, Brother Jermaine. You can answer this first. Okay. Do the brothers believe, this is from Jason Waller, do the brothers believe in the priesthood of all believers? Christ says that the priests profane the Sabbath and are blameless. Explain. Uh, um, uh, good question. Um, the thing is, is that, yes, we do believe uh, in the priesthood of all believers. As a matter of fact, uh, earlier, Damon made a mention that Israel, we were undermining the relationship with Israel because they were a holy nation. When the New Testament clearly shows that we are a royal priesthood and a holy nation. So we are fitted into, we are grafted into that, that same type of relationship. Um, but in the particular passage where it talks about the, um, did you, uh, what, what scripture was that particularly that you're that you mentioning? You, you, did he did he quote the scripture? No, he didn't. He just asked a question. Um, try to help find it. What scripture was that about them being blameless for profaning the Sabbath? What scripture was that? Well, well, I mean, the thing is, you can't you can't profane the Sabbath. And I'll, I'll put it like this: you can't profane the Sabbath and be blameless. That's impossible. So if, if that's what the scripture is saying, there's a reference to uh, something that we're not quite understanding because other scripture says clearly not to profane the Sabbath. I just read that. So uh, the Sabbath cannot be profaned. We do know that. Um, uh, that. That's the way I answer that question. Until we find the scripture to read the particular passage, uh, you know, I would say that. Sorry about that. Matthew uh, 12 and 5. Matthew 12 and 5.
while you look for that, let me pause here. And uh, number one, thank you guys again. You guys are doing a, a great job with engaging the rules and, and flowing. Um, we have a lot of people on here. We're two hours in, and right now it's showing 244 people viewing. There's been so many uh, different comments and different things made. I think I even saw Brian Karn on here commenting a little bit a little bit ago. Uh, but people are being encouraged. What, um, what's the clock looking like? Because while he's looking for a scripture, it seems like time is elapsing. Yeah, I, I, we'll give him a break. We'll give him a break for a second because we didn't give the verse. But um, you guys are doing a great job and people are really uh, in tune. A couple extra conversations, but we're doing all right. So um, give you guys a couple more moments. Uh, I'd say let's questions. move on. I think <laughs> yeah, yeah. A more yeah. specific question because that one is just too, it's too general. Uh, what does the priesthood of believers have to do with the keeping of the Sabbath? It's not specific enough for us to spend time trying to uh, to answer. So I would say let's move on to a different, uh, uh, unless the gentleman from Virginia wants to attempt to answer. Uh, yeah, I was, yeah, I was going to say I don't, I, I don't necessarily know what this means. And I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try to make up what it means. I don't. I don't quite quite know the context of what he's saying here. I would have to study that particular scripture. So, Jason Waller, if you have more of a specific question uh, that you want to ask in reference to that scripture, uh, be more specific for us, and we'll get back to it. All right. All right. Let's. Uh, we're going to give it two more questions. Is that good for you guys? All right. That sounds good. Two more questions. Okay. Let's see. <clears throat> Okay. People are asking a lot of uh, asking a lot of law questions, um, and I, I think I want to make it clear for them um, that this was not a conversation about following the law or not. This conversation was specifically about are Christians required to keep the Sabbath today, and I think that going into should we follow the law at all takes us down a whole nother road. Would you guys agree with that? No, I don't agree, I don't agree with that at all. That's, 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 a, that's a scapegoat. That, that, that lets them off the hook. Uh, no, the Sabbath is a part of the law. And Damon has made several comments during this statement. He even said, I quote, the law has been abolished. That's, that's right against scripture. Christ said in Matthew 5 and 17, do not think that I come to abolish the law. Now, Damon, you can play the tape back because I heard him say I wrote it down because I wanted to address it. I didn't get a chance. The law of God has not been abolished. Neither has the Sabbath. Uh, and Damon has said that. Well, can we ask the question? Uh, you're, you're trying to give a response to a question that hasn't been asked. And when I mentioned the Sabbath, I mentioned it in in context of the law, but I wasn't just talking well, about. First of, all, you cut me first of all, you cut me off. I have not cut you off this whole debate. Yeah, you cut me off because you got angry because I because I I, I verified something yeah, you said that was contrary. You're talking scripture. about questions. You cut me off. Yeah. So so my question to both of you is because if we get into the law outside of the Sabbath and we focus on the law, we can go a whole nother direction. Exactly. Right. 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 We're not going there. Right. That's what my question is. Right. Okay. I mean, but we but we we can give a general like we can give a general layout of is the law fulfilled should we keep the law it, you know they can ask some simple law questions it doesn't have to be a long drawn out but thing we, we agreed simple. that the debate was specifically yeah. about the sabbath we the sabbath is a part of the law but we okay. have to stay we have to stay a little bit more specific all right so i'll just say so i'll just say do not think that i come to abolish the law i come to I, but to fulfill and the one who teaches men to, to keep these commandments you haven't heard the question my friend no i'm talking about the law we decided we're not going to take the question about law are we going to do law questions or what? Let's wait for the question. What, what I'm saying is I'm trying to. He says not doing the question. I'm filtering through these because people's questions are starting to get into the law. Okay. I want us to lose track. So some of these questions people are asking now are jumping from the Sabbath and going into a bunch of other laws. So I'm trying to stay focused on that. All right. Okay. So let's, let's, let's go here. Um, Let's go here, and I'll ask this question to you first, Brother Jermaine, and then we'll give Damon a chance to respond. All right. And I don't want to misquote you, but I want to make sure this is clear. In, right. your, in your answer earlier, um, you stated that, um, that you know, we should follow the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath, um, and that if we don't, that there's a, there's a 
spiritual blessing that we miss and that we're cut off in a sense of our understanding spiritually. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. In, in that, though, if you're saying that the law is something that we are supposed to keep, it's mm -hmm. commanded by God, which was part of the stance uh, and proposition um, that you gave that you were affirmative about. Right. If it's clear and concise that God is saying we have to keep it. And the question came to you earlier, which was, how do we keep it? And that question was kind of, you know, kind of go as you feel, whatever helps you grow in God type of response. No, so, no, I wouldn't. no, it wasn't. I'm not putting words in your mouth. So my question, my question to that is, can you be more specific according to scripture okay. on what keeping the Sabbath looks like? Because that could be interpreted based on your answer a lot of different ways from what a person thinks edifies them and, gr and growing in their faith. So if the law is very clear and specific and concise, then can you give a specific, concise, scriptural answer on how to keep the law? I'm well, sorry, how to keep the Sabbath? I I well, I mean, already, I, I, I'm sorry that it came across that it wasn't precise, but really, it's really, uh, it's really, you know, it's not really that much instruction. The instruction is not to work. I said that. I, I quoted that from Exodus 20, right? Did I not say that? Right. Yes. So you don't you don't do your you don't do your survival work. And then I quoted a scripture from uh, Isaiah 58 that shows that you 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 separated from the things you do on other days. You know, so it says not doing your own pleasure, your own words. So basically, it's just it's, it's showing us that we have to put more focus into godly things, holy things. The scripture talks about discerning between clean and unclean, just like people don't, uh, you know, holy and unholy. It's like people do on Sunday. On Sunday, you you uh, you separate. My, my mother, I grew up in a household. Sunday was our Sabbath. I couldn't go outside and play with my friends in the neighborhood, you know, things like that. You know, so she limited me to just doing anything. It was a holy day. But there are some things you can do that you have to use your judgment on. That's 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 the believer's personal relationship with God and the conviction of the spirit when it comes down to exactly what you do. The scripture does not give that. And that's what the Pharisees were given in the Talmud. They were given, you can't go this far, you can't cook this, you can't do this. That's not scriptural. If you can't pick, you can't pick wheat as you walk through the field. You got that, that's not scriptural, you know, because you know, so so the thing is that you can't heal, that's not scriptural. Definitely a day to do spiritual work. So I said it's a day to do it's, it's a holy convocation, Leviticus 23. That's the day you're supposed to go to church. It's it's the day that you uh stop working. And other than that, it's a day that you, you know, do things that are spiritual, whatever. There's not, a, I'm sorry, I can't give you any more specific, but that's all the scripture says. And I think it's pretty clear. If you go to church on Sunday, same vibe, you know, you separate the time and you do church things. So let me, let me ask one more question to that more specifically before Pastor Damon responds. Yeah. And that as well, um, you said like uh, working was very clear that that was one that you're not supposed to do and commanded by the Lord on keeping the Sabbath. Is that correct? Right. I don't want to misquote you. Okay. Right, right. Then you said, but we don't live in Israel. So if you have to work, I'm not telling you to quit your job. Right. You got to wait till the Lord gives you an opportunity. Right. Okay. I can see that. So how do we reconcile that with what you're saying as far as your, as, as far as your position in God commanding this? Right, right. Well, actually, the scripture that we had a little trouble on in Matthew 12, that's basically what the scripture is talking about. It says that, you know, David, uh, uh, when he was home, he went in there, he did something that was unlawful. Well, scripture shows us that God requires mercy more than anything, more than sacrifice. At the end of the day, when you are in situations where you have to do something, who will not pull the ox out of the ditch on the Sabbath? God is not tripping. He's not being petty. He's saying, you know, uh, if you got to do it, you got to do it. Another scripture uh, uh, that, that clarifies that is the scriptures uh, in the New Testament where it talks about the, uh, uh, in Titus, where this, the, the guy is, uh, is a slave. And we find principles about uh, whatever condition you find yourself in when you are converted, you have to remain in. You know, if you, if you work in the American system, you are a slave to that system, paycheck to paycheck. I mean, you just can't go out and tell your job, I can't work on the Sabbath. You can't do that. So the scripture shows us uh, through spiritual understanding and through what the word says here uh, in different places uh, that God allows mercy in situations where things are not, uh, where you can do, where you can't do something. You know, if you're a slave, 
You know, he told the slaves, be, he told the slaves, uh, the, the slave masters to, to uh, you know, be cool with your slaves. Don't, don't mistreat your slaves in Christ. You know what I'm saying? They still had slaves going on. You see that, the, the example in the passage. So people were still having situations they had to deal with. So same thing here. The whole principle is that you try to do the will of God. If you can't, you wait until you have the opportunity to do it. I, we're not teaching people go out there and quit your jobs and things because we're in a situation where you just can't do that. And if you do do that, then that's fine too. You can go and quit if you want to. If you want to step out of faith, God leads you that way, and you can do that. But we don't, you know, we don't teach that. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Pastor Damon, do you want to respond to that? No, I'll just pass on the question because, again, uh, his whole point is moot. Um, there's no scripture. He has not proven a case from the New Testament where Christians are commanded to keep the Sabbath. So even talking about uh, what we should do uh, versus what Jews actually did in keeping the Sabbath, uh, I, will, I will respond to this. He, he quoted Matthew 5 uh, and 12, where Jesus said, uh, I think not that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish it, uh, but to fulfill it. Um, the gentleman here from Virginia uh, obviously doesn't know um, what that actually means contextually. Again, Jesus is a Jew. His audience is primarily Jewish. Uh, and the words there, abolish and fulfill, uh, actually are very rabbinic terms that you'll find even in extra biblical literature preceding Jesus's incarnation. And so, so the word to abolish means to, or to destroy the law means to interpret it incorrectly. Uh, the, the, the word fulfill actually means to interpret the word of God correctly. This can be found even in the Mishnah, uh, which predates uh, the oral sayings actually predate the time of Jesus, where two rabbis are arguing and one of the rabbis accuses the other rabbi of destroying the Torah. The context of that means that he is not interpreting it correctly. Now, our friend here from Virginia is going to Google that because he's never done Jewish studies. And if he's ever actually did Jewish studies, several years of it, he would understand that these are rabbinic terms. And if we are contextualizing Jesus as a Jewish rabbi of his time, speaking in idioms and nuances of his day that are familiar to people who are listening to him, you'd understand that Jesus is not saying that he's not talking about abolishing the law as in doing away with it. He is talking about he is not teaching the law incorrectly. He is correctly teaching the law. Thirty even, seconds. Even if, however, uh, we were to say he is talking about fulfilling, well, that would actually uh, fall right in line with what Jesus says about Jesus, that Paul, that Jesus fulfills the law. That is, he is the end of it. He is the plero, pleru rather. He is the completion of it. So the reality is, is that when you're doing all of this proof texting, you really don't know what these texts mean. You're just plucking them out of context Three seconds. and using them in a way that doesn't actually support your point. So right. I'll, I'll go ahead and take my question now. Thank you. Wait a minute, I don't get a chance to rebut that statement? No. It, no. He, he oh, come on. oh, come on, come on. But in you, that oh, was, that you was a reverse. Oh, come on. You can't do it. Sorry. Come on. That come come on. He, he, he said something that was so non scriptural there. This is what we can do. This is what we can do. Come on, B. It that was it. a rebuttal to Here your rebuttal. Go. I got y'all. That's why, that's why you, that's why. Both of y'all are on mute. So I hope y'all can hear me. I got the power of the mute. This is what we're going to do. <laughs> Let me bring y'all back in peace. Okay. In Jesus All right. Name. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. What we're going to do. Um, we're going to leave you guys with five minutes. That's long because y'all talk a lot. We'll leave y'all. We'll leave y'all with five minutes closing remarks. Each one of you can state your point position. If it's changed, if it's, if it's the same um, closing remarks for the people um, that are listening so we can wrap this thing up. All right. Would either one of you elect to go first? 
Yeah, I will. Okay. Gentlemen from Virginia, go first. Of course, you will, because you want you want to have the last words. I'm gonna have the last words. <laughs> I'll give them to you. Um, yes, well, uh, I think that um, you know uh, this this has been a good debate, and um, the points that I want you guys to um, to uh, look you know to really look out for is the um, Damon tried to say that I did not answer certain things. He said that I I did not answer. That the new that Sabbath was commanded in the New Testament. I did answer that. I said that the commandments from the Old Testament are still applicable in the New Testament, just like homosexuality. And Brother Jason, I know he got tithes and offering in his church. That's from the Old Testament. The oil, that's from the Old Testament. The altar, that's from the Old Testament. So what I'm saying is I answered that. It is a continuation of the word of God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Alpha and Omega, the same God that you argue created the world, is the one who created Sabbath, the Lord of the Sabbath. So I answered that. So don't let Damon talk to you and say, I did answer when I did answer this. You're not Gino Genius. You ain't going to bully me. All right? I answered the question. Colossians, the second chapter, also, Colossians, the second chapter, I answered that. I said that that was not talking to Gentiles. Uh, that was, it was talking to Gentiles. It was talking to people that believed in keeping the Sabbath and that were keeping the Sabbath. It's not talking to people that weren't. So you're reading it as if it's talking to you. Do we don't keep the Sabbath? Well, let no one judge you. That's not who it's talking to. It's talking to those who were being judged because now they were Gentile converts and they were keeping the Sabbath and they were being judged. Now I can show you for example today, the majority doesn't keep the Sabbath and we're judged as if we're doing, as Damon wrote on this page, we're cults because we have, we have believed in law keeping and commandment keeping. But Revelation 22 and 14 says, blessed are they that keep his commandments that they may have the right of, to life, a right of tree of life and enter the city by the gate. The, the man in uh, Matthew 19 asked Jesus, how can I ent enter into the kingdom of God? He said, keep the commandments. He said, which ones? He started naming the Ten Commandments. He didn't name all of them. He gave a summary of a few of them, all from the Ten Commandments. Same principle. You break one, you break them all. So to say that the Ten Commandments, which Damon has said today, are not applicable and done away with, he even made a statement about the law being abolished. And then, he, and then when I corrected him, he tried to go on to his teaching that you guys, that it was a rabbinical term. When Jesus clearly in that chapter, chapter 5, read it for yourself, he goes on to show how the law is fulfilled. Spiritually, he makes the law even greater. Not only can you not commit adultery, but guess what? You can't even lust after him in your heart. So he, he, he fulfilled the law by making it more applicable. It still applies in the letter in some degrees. You can't commit adultery in the flesh, nor can you commit it in the spirit. Now, some things you can't fulfill in the flesh because some things were given in civil nation. There's laws about taxes. There's laws about uh, your animal rights. And guess what? Those, would be, those are all applicable if we were a civil nation. As a matter of fact, I believe that when we come back to judge the world, 1 Corinthians 6 chapter, we shall judge the world, even angels, we're going to be use, using those laws. The laws will go forth from Zion, all right? And last thing I'll say here is Isaiah 66 and 23. Damon never answered that question. The question is, is this, these, are, these are references to the millennial kingdom, and Sabbath keeping is there. As a matter of fact, I'll give you even one more. Zechariah, the 14th chapter. If you read Zechariah, the 14th chapter, it goes on in the last verses, verses 14 down, it says, the people who are, the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, they will be hidden with the plague be struck with the plague of Egypt. They will be struck with the plague of Egypt. David talked about Egypt being uh, uh, isolated to Israel. Well, Egypt is a spiritual type uh, bigger than Israel. That's why God used them. Pharaoh is a type of Satan. And God uses that in Isaiah uh, 66 and, and Zechariah 14. Read that scripture. It says, those that do not come to keep the Feast of Tabernacles shall be stricken the plague. You, hope you guys got your pens? Isaiah 14? Uh, Zechariah 14? Put that down. That's clearly a millennial prophecy that you must be keeping the feast. So Jesus even said that he would not drink again of the wine of the Passover until he came back. Pentecost, the, the, uh, the, the fulfilling of the uh, first fruits, you know, these things are all prophetic. And there's no way in scripture that tells us we do not have to keep the laws of God. The Bible, what Paul is explaining in the hard understanding scriptures is that we are no longer, no longer under the penalty for breaking law. All right. Uh, uh, Hebrews 10, 17 says, uh, I will write my laws in your heart and your mind and your lawless deeds. I will remember no more. So now we're not under the penalty for breaking law. We're not using law for justification. We have faith by grace. But that includes law. Last scripture, Romans 3, 31. Do we make the law void through faith? What's the answer, David? Certainly not. Romans 3, 31. Y'all writing? Romans 3, 31. 
Do we make the law, the law void through faith? Certainly not, yet we establish law. Faith establishes law because faith comes by the hearing of the word of God. And if you don't believe in the Sabbath, then there's a lack of faith in the scripture. You only keep the other days because you've been taught. It's not in the Bible. No, in this whole conversation, you've never proved one time that your Sunday keeping is validated in the Bible. I'm okay, done. Thank you. You got an extra 52 seconds, by the way, but. I'm you know, done. You were getting into your hoop, so I didn't want to interrupt. I heard no, I, I did all good. Yeah, well, that, that's, my final, that's my final plea. All right. Thank, we're you. Go to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll say in my uh, in my closing uh, again, uh, you know, the uh, gentleman here from Virginia does a lot of uh, dancing around, uh, but his um, eisegesis there doesn't establish his case. Uh, so again, from Deuteronomy chapter five, we we have shown clearly uh, that, uh, and of course from Exodus twenty and Exodus thirty one. Uh, that the Sabbath was given specifically to Israel, that is national, physical, ethnic Israel. Uh, it was given to them by God. It was specifically given to them uh, because God had delivered them from Egypt. That is not spiritual Egypt, that is physical Egypt. And they had just been delivered from Egypt, in fact, at the time, uh, not long, uh, well, well, well not, not long earlier, I should say, by the time they were giving the law at Sinai. So, so the reality is, is that, you know, this is, this is a covenant that was being made with them. Now, specifically, uh, God says that the Sabbath was a sign between me and you. So I want you to notice that it's, a, again, a specific sign between God and Israel. So it follows that if Israel had not the covenant prior to and, and of course, the text says that this covenant was not made with our fathers, but with us. Well, just as the Abrahamic covenantal sign was circumcision, you don't find anybody keeping circumcision or commanded to keep circumcision prior to the Abrahamic covenant. Just as circumcision was the sign of the Abrahamic covenant, Sabbath was the sign for the covenant that God made with Moses and the children of Israel that day. And, and, and so uh, that's one point. The other point is this, the Sabbath was to be kept holy, even as God called Israel out and separated them from the nations. It was a sign of being called out as a holy nation. By virtue of the Sabbath being used by God as a special sign to set them apart from other nations, that automatically rules out that the other nations didn't have it because if they did, there would be nothing special about it. He tried to say that all of the laws were up, 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 applicable, but again, we've already read scriptures showing that they had been moved out of the way. But the reality is this, is that the moral law, according to Paul in Romans 2, the Gentiles already had that. And so he's attempting to apply uh, everything that is moral. Paul said those things were written on the consciences of the Gentiles without receiving the law. And so the Sabbath was not a moral law. The Sabbath was a specific ceremonial sign between God and Israel. But, but murder and adultery and all of those other moral things, Paul said that the Gentiles who did not have the Torah did by nature the things that were contained in it. So no, you have not proven uh, that the Sabbath was rolled over. You can't because the scripture has already told you that it was a special sign that God made between him and Israel. And then you cannot make Gentile believers in Christ part of Israel because they are not. <clears throat> the Bible says that Christ has made of both Jew and Gentile, one new man, not a new Israel, my friend, one new man that is made up of Jew and Gentile. We, when, when the Bible says that we have been grafted in, mind you, we were a wild olive branch. And so what was Israel? A branch. They were not the vine and they were not the root. You want to know who the root is? The root is Christ. So we have not been grafted into Israel. We have been grafted into Christ as a wild olive branch. And so you've got to get your theology straight, my friend, is, is that the Sabbath 
is not a requirement for uh, non-Jewish believers. Lastly, I will say this in Thanks. Acts chapter in Acts chapter fifteen, when the when the first church council convened, they ruled out, and and the discussion was not just about circumcision. The text tells us that they were talking about the law of Moses, the ruling, my friend, that they that Jewish apostles ruled upon by aid of the Holy Spirit is, is that they would not put the burden of the law of Moses upon the Gentiles. The only expectation that is said in the text is that they were to observe moral commands, moral commands, not Sabbath, not Shabbat, and not Brit Milah, that is uh, circumcision, and not Kushrat not the dietary laws. So all of the ceremonial laws, which Sabbath is a part of, were not an expectation for them. So you That's have your time, to sir. Over to make your case. Thank you. Thank you. My brothers, uh, this has been a wonderful two hours and 20 something minutes spent with you guys. Um, you know, we're going to talk some more, the three of us, if we're going to, you know, continue to maybe have another conversation about some other com uh, comments. But over the next few days, I want you guys to enjoy the 10 million comments that are on here. There's so many conversations. I'm not, I'm not looking. You know, but, uh, and, and we'll talk about it. But listen, my, my prayer, my prayer is that through all of this, um, one, it can be an example to people that when people stand on two sides and disagree, there can still be respect. Uh, we don't have to dog each other or you know, beat each other up uh, on a personal level, um, right. but we can disagree on some things. Um, and I want people to be able to take what you guys have said and go out and research it for their own. Research the Greek and the Hebrew. Good luck. Uh, research the scriptures that were used and, you know, get to some understanding so that uh, you can be in the place that God wants you to be. But ultimately, the Holy Spirit is going to have to give us understanding because we can't just do it on our own. So uh, I appreciate you brothers. Thank you so much to all of our viewers and listeners. I don't know what's next. Maybe we'll get Brian Karn and Gino Jennings on here. <laughs> I got all these comments on here since y'all did open up the can of worms. But you know, again, we appreciate you and thank you so much. Uh, everybody on here, God bless you guys. Make sure you share this, converse, talk about it, and we'll see what happens next. Peace.